and advise members that the committee is in public session, even though the public gallery remains closed to visitors. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to add all members into the spotlight for the next four items? Agenda item one is apologies. Are members aware of any apologies? Uh, there's none, just a few members will be late. Okay. Agenda item two then, chairperson's business. In terms of free school meals, can I remind members that press reports have suggested that the Minister has secured executive support and funding for the provision of free school meals for eligible children and young people during all holiday periods until Easter 2022. Is that right, Clark? Um, that is my understanding, yes. Easter, okay. Not, not next, not 21? No, 2022. Okay. It's a, it's a lot of money, 40 million. Excellent. Uh, members, this is obviously very welcome news as part of the campaign to end holiday hunger uh, and an issue that the committee has been raising uh, for some time. Can I seek members' agreement to write to the Department of Education seeking clarity as to why payments are to be made to families of eligible, eligible children? rather than the provision of food parcels or free school meal alternatives in line with recent practice and just to get further confirmation uh, of those proposals. Agreed? Agreed. Uh, Chair, could I come on? Yeah, Karen. Just also, I suppose, to um, uh, express um, our, our gratitude that, that actually that this has been done, it has been worked up um, uh, and we would like to see Obviously, um, the the fund the funding in place for next year. I know the funding that's there at the minute will be in place until the end of the financial year. But given that the commitment's there to April twenty twenty two, so hopefully the funding will follow as well. I'm happy to seek that clarification as well. Members content? Agreed. Yes. Oh. <clears throat> Agreed. Yep. Okay. No, mem no yeah. sorry, the members will have to say something. <laughs> Clark, Clark needs some of you to say agreed for us. I think, I, think, uh, I, I would, following on from the deputy's uh, proposal, agree. I think we should indeed express our uh, congratulations to the minister and indeed our appreciation of the work that he has put in, in in delivering this. What I think has gone beyond all our expectations. Like you, when I read the press report, I thought 2022, that must be an error. Indeed, my belief is that it is 2022, and I think that is extremely welcome. Agreed. Daniel? Just to echo those, those words as well, I think this is very welcome and will alleviate pressure on families that are struggling uh, during this period. Uh, and I'm glad that Minister Weir has listened to the calls of this committee. I just hope that he listens to the concerns of this committee when it comes to examinations in the same effort. So uh, it, it's welcome you today, but I hope there's other things that he's going to listen to us about in relation to our concerns uh, during this pandemic. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Agreed? Members agreed? Agreed. Yeah, agreed. Thanks, Robin. Agreed. <laughs> okay, agenda item 2.2, Homeless Period Belfast. Can I advise members uh, that members of the committee met with Homeless Period Belfast and Councillor Glenn Finlay to discuss period poverty in schools? and a note of proceedings has been circulated. Can I seek members' views on the provision of free period product products in all schools, particularly in view of the, of the passage of the period products free provision Scotland Bill <coughs> 2020 at the Scottish Parliament, I believe was passed yesterday, Clark, uh, circulated by email yesterday. Can I seek members' agreement for the committee to write to the Department of Education seeking an update on the pilot undertaken in North Belfast uh, with regards to uh, free sanitary product provision and the scoping work on free uh, sanitary product provision in all schools, indicating the committee's support for the campaign for the provision of free period products in all schools in Northern Ireland. Members agreed? Agreed. Agreed? Agreed. Okay, thanks, Clark. Agenda item 2.3 is the Ulster University review of segregation in preschools. Can I advise members that the University of Ulster, Ulster University, has just published a report into segregation in preschools? This has been circulated to members by email. 
the report suggests that 70% of preschools um, are highly segregated and 47% are entirely segregated. That is to say, there appears to be limited mixing of different religious backgrounds in those preschools. Can I seek members' agreement to write to the Department of Education asking for its uh, response to the report and for clarity as to how it is to respond to this situation? Agreed? Members agreed? Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay. Agreed. Thank you. Draft minutes. Can I refer members to draft minutes of the committee meeting of 18th of November 2020 at page 6 of your meeting packs and seek your agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> matters Agreed. arising. There are no matters arising. Anyone need to raise any matters? Nope. Okay, agenda item five then is our oral briefing on the independent review of integrated education. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses? Can I refer members to a note from the committee clerk at page 14, a copy of the independent report on integrated education at page 27, predecessor committee correspondence on FIDO, uh, the Fair Employment Please. Treatment Order. Sorry? Sorry, Chairperson. I think yep. broadcasting have added the wrong witnesses. That's um, the department, the department. Okay. It's Colin Cavanagh. Sorry, Chairperson, you okay. were saying. <laughs> I think that's been corrected, yeah? Yeah. That's great. Okay. Uh, predecessor Committee correspondence on the Fair Employment Treatment Order and the Certificate in Religious Education at page 161 and 219. And relevant extracts from a predecessor committee inquiry into shared and integrated education at page 221. Can I welcome Colm Kavanagh, the independent review co-author. Um, by way of welcome, say that last week the Education Committee um, made its views known on the New Decade New Approach Independent Review of Education, which has one of its objectives uh, to be the consideration of the prospect of moving towards a single education system. It is anticipated that this latest review will draw upon the findings of earlier reports, and it is for this reason that the committee is very glad to welcome uh, Colm Kavanagh, one of the co-authors of the Independent Report on Integrated Education, to the committee today. Uh, Colm, you have 15 minutes to make an opening statement, and then this will be followed by questions and answers from the members. You're very welcome, Colm. Okay, thank you very much. Am I visible? You're not visible, but you're loud and clear. Okay, well, uh, shall I proceed? Yeah. Do we, do we, is audio okay, Clark? I think it is. Uh, it yeah. just is the, um, has the witness switched on their camera? Yeah, is there a, a camera function yes. or a video function on your yeah, yeah, device? The, the sound and vision are both switched on at my end. Okay, okay that's a shame. We're, we're missing out on your beautiful face, Colin, but otherwise we can hear you loud and clear. There's a, there's a little indicator on the top right hand of my vision that, uh, you, that I do not have a camera on, but in fact the camera is on Okay. at, at my end. Well, we'll proceed with your opening statement, Colm, and then if you... Um, oh, there we go. That's you. Uh, there we are. Okay. That's you, Colm. That's great. Oh, okay, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, and, and also members. I'm very pleased to be here this morning. And I want to record the apologies of my fellow author, um, Professor Margaret Topping from Queen's University, who had a prior commitment at this time and, and can't be present. But the report was uh, unanimous, so She's happy that, that I represent the views of both of us. Um, the work of the Education Committee is hugely important, obviously, because it shapes the lives and future of the young people now and of the community as a whole in future. And obviously, um, you have a difficult job to try to meet all the competing demands, not only for your time, but also for the resources, even, in the, even though you have the second largest budget in the Assembly. Uh, th there are huge demands uh, all the time on your on your work, but I hope that what I can do this morning is bring you some information that will be helpful and useful to you uh, as you go forward. 
Um, before we get into the immediate details of the report, I think it's really important to do three things. One is to talk about why we should have a united school system. And it doesn't matter what it's called or who manages it, but that we have a, a system whereby our children go to school together. And the second is the cost uh, of this and why professional estimates uh, appear to say that we're spending at least, or in the region of, uh, a million pounds a week by having two parallel systems. And then thirdly, I want to talk about how we get to the present system, uh, and then we can get into the, the details of it. Uh, the committee clerk has been very careful to tell me to, to uh, not overrun my time. Um, reconciliation, um, that's obviously what it's about. And psychologists and sociologists tell us that if we divide a, a group, uh, then we automatically lay the foundations for rivalry and competition, envy, jealousy, friction, and even worse, as, as we know in Northern Ireland, you created them in a situation. And there's a, there's a quote that I, I think is relevant to yourselves as lawmakers by Ambassador Mitchell Reese, the former UN, uh, US Special Advisor to Northern Ireland, and he's still a member of the Independent Reporting Commission. And when he was talking to the National Committee on US Foreign Policy in New York, in 2004, he said the following, after taking on this assignment, that's a special envoy, I was astonished to learn that roughly 95% of Northern Ireland school children are educated in segregated schools. As Americans, we have first-hand experience of segregation not so long ago, and we know it does not work. Segregation shortchanges the students by denying them exposure to one half of their society, and it weakens the country by embedding misunderstanding and distrust and then the, the part that has particular resonance, I, I would think, for yourselves as lawmakers. As a matter of priority, he said, the Northern Ireland government and civic and religious leaders should recognise that their society will be richer and stronger if their education system encourages more integration so children grow up embracing the diversity of their own culture. So in a sense, what Ambassador Rees was doing there was pointing out the downsides of it, the bad sides of having uh, parallel education systems. But my favourite quote, uh, which, I, which talks about the benefits of it rather than the downside, is uh, the benefits of having a United system, was actually said by Humat, who was in effect the parish priest of the Waterside uh, Catholic Church here in Derry, London, Derry, my own city, in the mid-1800s. And before he went to Maynooth to become a priest, he had actually attended Foyle College. And his quote was, I was educated for years at a school superintended by Protestant clergymen. My school fellows being almost all Protestants, I cannot but regard them with feelings of affection. And that really is what it's all about. Uh, so reconciliation. Uh, the Good Friday Agreement, Belfast Good Friday Agreement in 1998 mentions reconciliation eight times. And it says an essential aspect of that is the promotion of a culture of tolerance, including initiatives to facilitate and encourage integrated education and mixed housing. And of course, we're now in a situation where education is maybe even more important because the, the, the NISRA, our own public service statistics agency, says that only 31% of the population of Northern Ireland regard themselves as living in a mixed neighborhood. And 80% of public housing is segregated and 90% of public housing in Belfast. So that's, from the, that's published by the Executive Office in the Northern Ireland Good Relations Indicator a year ago, uh, November 2019. The New Decade New Approach Agreement earlier this year that you, you've just mentioned, the External Independent Review uh, wants to focus on uh, moving towards a single education system. And it also talks about the Executive supporting children and young people of different backgrounds together in the classroom. And reconciliation is why the Integrated Education Fund has raised over the years £25 million to help fund parents' wish to have integrated education for their children. And reconciliation is the reason that the Integrated Schools Movement here were internationally nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2011, 2019 and 2020. And very importantly, the Consultative Group of the Past in 2009, which had eight, only eight members, three of them are current clergy, one professor of theology, one former Catholic priest, and one principal of a CCMS group. And I'm emphasizing that because it's certainly not a group that was anti-faith or anti-church, but they said, the reality is that reconciliation may never be achieved if our children continue to attend separated schools. And then when the political parties, all the main political parties, there are, there are members who have supported a, a united system over the years. 
Peter Robinson's uh, well-known quote that we're in a, a system of benign apartheid because, of course, it's voluntary segregation. Martin McGuinness uh, said that if he, and I think he was including Peter Robinson at the time, said if they were starting with a clean slate, they would not create the system that they had, but they would start with a single system. Ulster University, sorry, Ulster Unionist Party policy is uh, in, not for uh, in favour of denominational education. The SDLP emphasises parental choice, but if parents want integrated education, then the party would back that right. The Alliance Party, the Green Party and People Before Profit all want uh, a single united system. So that's, I could go into much more detail about that, and I'm happy to if people want me to, but we don't have very much time. Cost. Uh, there are two professional estimates of the um, the cost of the division in Northern Ireland as a whole. One was done in 2007 by Deloitte's research into the financial cost of the Northern Ireland divide, and the other one more recently in 2016 by Ulster University Economic Policy Centre. Its report was cost of division, and they differ quite widely in the overall cost of uh, division in Northern Ireland. But their their estimates for education are quite quite close to each other. They're both in the 50 millions. Um, uh, and if you take the median cost between the two of them, then you're talking about 57 and a quarter million pounds every year. And that's only about two or three percent of the of your budget for the Department of Education. But if you total that up since 1998 and the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, then you're talking about one and a quarter billion pounds. So the demands that you have on your resources all the time, uh, part of the reason for that demand is that we're spending a lot of money on running parallel systems. And then finally, I want to talk about how we got to where we are today, because there are some misunderstandings about it. Over the last 190 years, three different governments have tried to introduce a united school system. In 1831, when the national school system was set up across the whole island, uh, by Chief Secretary Edward Stanley MP, who'd be the predecessor of Brandon Lewis today. And of course, the whole island of Ireland was in the United Kingdom at the time. And he, over a series of commissions that had been done about education, going back even before 1800 into the old Irish Parliament in, in Dublin, they took all that information and proposed a system whereby the government would, for the first time ever in the English speaking world, uh, subsidise the building of school buildings and the payment of teachers. Uh, in a specific way, and that was that they, they wanted specifically that the children would all go to the same school uh, and that religious education would be limited to a particular time of the week, one or two days a week, to be given by the clergy of the denomination of the children. And that aside from that, denominational education and teaching would be completely banned from it, from the, the three hours. And we then went to the three main churches. Uh, Catholic Church said, OK, we'll go along with that. The Church of Ireland, which is then the established church, did not agree with it and said that they would continue to run their existing Church of Ireland schools rather than going to it. And the Presbyterian Church didn't agree with it either. Uh, and the Presbyterian Church then, over a period of years, argued very strongly and eventually negotiated what were, in effect, Presbyterian national schools. Anybody could go to them, but they were designed by and for Presbyterians. So the Presbyterian children went to those schools. The Anglican children went to the Church of Ireland schools. And there was nobody left to go to school with the Catholics. That's how we got a separate Catholic school system, because the other churches wanted their schools. So we had a denominational system then from the 1840s for the rest of the century. In 1923, the first Minister for Education in Northern Ireland, Lord Londonderry, a unionist uh, member of parliament, uh, he was a Minister for Education and passed an Education Act in 1923. And again, he wanted a system where, uh, that would have all children going to the same schools. And he, there were two parts of the act. One of it uh, forbade denominational teaching of religion during school hours or by the school principal and, and paid hours. And also um, he, for, the act forbade discrimination on the grounds of religion in the appointment of teachers. So that was duly passed in 1923. But then there was a there was a, a, a lobby of uh, ministers led by the Reverend Corky, uh, Presbyterian minister, but there were also Church of Ireland ministers, Church of Ireland people and uh, Methodist people. And in two years, they uh, got the, the Lord Craig Avon to um, bring in an amending bill, which abolished those two things. And so, so they could discriminate on appointing of teachers on the basis of religion, and they could bring in uh, religious teaching, denominational teaching during school hours. 
1925, so the Catholic Church had continued with its own schools that had never gone into that system, and so we, the, the, the system that we have today was then firmly embedded. 1974, the first power sharing executive uh, in its program for government uh, had integrated education in it. Um, you can read about this in Paddy Devlin's uh, memoir, Straight Left. Um, and so three times the Whig government in the 1830s, the Unionist government in the 1920s, and the power sharing government in the 1970s all tried to do it and all failed. So a group of parents then said, if the churches aren't going to do it and the government isn't going to do it, we do it ourselves. And that was all children together. So that in 1981, they opened Lagan College without any government support and in face of some hostility, in fact, from various quarters. And that was exactly 150 years after the government had tried to create the kind of schools that Lagan College were, uh, was now doing in, in uh, 1981. And public opinion was also changing over that time. Um, it, in the 1970s and 80s and since then, uh, inter-church schools have now uh, started to come up in the world. In fact, I'm editing a new edition of the International Directory of Joint Protestant Roman Catholic Schools, Colleges and Universities. Uh, there are several dozen of them. There's 45 in the, in the new edition, um, but none yet in Northern Ireland. There's, there's one in the Republic. But public opinion was also changing. One example of that is that, again, in my own city, the Derry Journal in 1977 had an editorial severely criticizing nationalist councillors for not defending Catholic schools. That was 1977. 2016, subsequently, they're now saying that children should all go to the same schools. That would be an indication of uh, how the change in public opinion. So, so I'm happy to discuss any of those three areas, why, why reconciliation, what reconciliation does, the cost and the history of how we got to where we are today. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure that I have any time left now, but there are about a dozen issues then within the review of education report that I, I, I want to raise, uh, and I'm happy to do that as time goes on. Thank you, Chairperson. Colm, I have you down as a, as a very short minute or two left here. Are there any key, key points of the report you want to point to before we start well, questions? Uh, the, the, the first thing I think you may have mentioned uh, before the meeting began that the, the request that this whole report would be provided to the proposed independent uh, review of the reform of education in Northern Ireland under the new decade, new approach. And then there are three issues in the report, recommendation two and three, which are kind of connected, and recommendation 38. Um, 38, you mentioned earlier on, uh, I think you may be going to talk to the department about it afterwards, that about the teacher exemption from fair employment uh, law. And the, the, rev the review would ask the committee to support the request to the executive office, which is responsible, as recommended by the Equality Commission in 2004 for post-primary schools and in 2014 for all schools, that that teacher exemption be removed as soon as possible. And then recommendation two and three are that uh, the department bring forward legislation. This would be the Department of Education to place a duty on the Department of Education and on the Education Authority to facilitate and promote integrated education, that the government must drive it. Uh, it's, it's not enough to leave it to parents to do this on a voluntary basis. Uh, the, the parents have already created 65 integrated schools uh, in various, many of them are controlled integrated schools now. But, but it's not driven by the government and it's left to, uh, to parents to do. Uh, indeed, with 65 schools, there will, there will shortly be more integrated schools in Northern Ireland than there are grammar schools. There are 67 of them. Those, so the recommendation that the government place a duty on the Department of Education and the Education Authority to, to promote integrated education, the requirement that they would report every year, every two years uh, to yourselves in the assembly that would be the, both of those would be the same as the government's current role to promote shared education and to report on shared education and also to remove the teacher exemption. And I should say that uh, uh, as well as the uh, government spending uh, about a million, a million, million pounds a week more than would be required apparently if there was a United system, that even within that system, the government over a six-year period, the Department of Education report on shared education specifies that the, that the department had earmarked £285 million pounds over that period to get children from the parallel system to connect with each other. The difficulty of shared education is certainly a good thing, 
but uh, the difficulty is that if the government stops paying that money, uh, there are many people are saying that the, the shared education contact would subside. Thank you. Thanks very much, Colin. Um, just, just over your, your time there. Uh, I'll keep the rest of us, as I said earlier, to seven minutes today, given this, the short time that we have available to us. Can I bring in Deputy Chairperson Karen Mullen, MLA? Good morning, Colm. Good morning, Karen. It's great to see you, Colm, and thank you so much for coming to the committee. It's great to finally have you in front of us. Um, and I want to thank uh, Margaret also, um, along with yourself, for the work that you have done on the report. Uh, I've met you many times over the last number of years, and you've, um, I suppose, helped shape my views and, and, and that going forward. And just as you say there, rec reconciliation is what it is all about. And I fully agree with Martin McGuinness's statement um, that you presented this morning. Concern that I have is that now over 20 years since the Good Friday Agreement, we are not seeing the movement required to a more integrated education system here. Uh, particularly think about in the West um, and also in our own city column, as you know, we've met on many occasions in relation to the offering and the growth that, that, that is not there. So a lot of work to be done. So just wanted to ask you in relation to going forward um, uh, around the independent review of education, do you see the recommendations uh, in your report feeding into that uh, review and possibly how, Colin? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. Maybe I should explain that you're one of the MLAs for FOIL and I live in FOIL. Um, but yes, uh, it, it, it's good to talk to you again. The, 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 the reason for asking that this would be given to the uh, panel to be set up uh, under the new decade, new approach uh, agreement is that there's, there's a lot of quite technical issues here that be done by that the department could simply do itself and can change. It's, it's way of doing things about prioritizing accommodation or about development proposals, etc. Uh, but the, the, the issue as a whole is whether or not Northern Ireland wants to have a unified, a united education system or not. And that, and that is specified as one of the issues that will be put in front of that uh, independent review that the, that the executive will commission. Thank you, Colm. Um, and uh, my, my last question is, um, how successfully do you think the integrated sector are at delivering parity of esteem between different identities and culture? This was raised with me quite a bit, Colin. Well, um, can I commend you to, uh, there's an organization called Integrated Alumni, which are, who are uh, um, pupils who have been at integrated schools and are now so uh, passionate about it that they've created this group in order to help lobby for it. Um, they, uh, 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 governments, as I say, have been trying to do this for nearly 200 years. Everybody accepts that it would be a good idea. It's better not to be separate. Uh, it's better not to uh, just have limited contact. It, it, it's, if, you, if, if you're only seeing somebody for an hour a week or, or only one class in a school is seen for an hour a week, then the, the report on shared education does show positive results for that. Um, but to be sitting beside somebody uh, all the time uh, is doing it. There's, there was a, a lovely quote again from a, a, a more well-known quote from a, a Catholic bishop, Dr. Doyle, in I think 1826 or something. We talked about he could th think, think of nothing that would be more conducive to good relations in Ireland as, as a whole at the time uh, than to have children attend the same school where they would, uh, there was a lovely phrase he used about where they would share the little intimacies that uh, often last for life uh, and I certainly can say not only, I originally thought that the impact of integrated education would simply be on the pupils who go to the schools, but I then realized that it affected the teachers, it affected the parents who go to the school, it affected the grandparents. It's just, it's just a really good thing. And, the, and since our housing is so segregated now, that it, it, this is one thing that parent, people can do without having to change their house. And the, the, uh, the, the Professor Rhiannon Turner from Queen's was one of the people we spoke to and remember that there was a, a, a quote that she said that uh, whereas separating people creates division, 
She said the divided school system in Northern Ireland is therefore likely to have a detrimental psychological impact, but close, close contact uh, encourages mutual respect and sharing. So, so yes, I, I certainly, uh, on the basis of my own ex- experience, can say that it does improve community relations uh, uh, and that the, the, the information I get from people who have been to integrated schools would bear that out. But some schools would do it more than others. It's, mm-hmm. it, it's, some, some, some schools would prefer never to raise the issues and other people would say, no, let's raise the issues and mm-hmm. tackle them. So that's a whole issue itself. Yeah, Colm, I think it's around in- increasing the level in- of inclusiveness. Um, I am a great supporter of the shared education uh, work and the project that's going on. But the more that I see, the more that I go out to meet with uh, children and, and sc- teachers and families and all, it just proves everything that you're saying. It needs to be embedded. We need to have that closer contact um, for, for our children. So uh, I would like to see, obviously, in the next number of years going ahead and the independent review that's coming out that um, we would see a greater change going forward in relation to that and it's a real opportunity for us all to work together in, in relation to the independent review so thank you once again Colm Chair that's me thank you. Thank, you. thank you thanks Karen Robin Newton thank you and uh, thank uh, Mr Callum for joining us at the committee it's, uh, I have to say it's a fairly easily read report so I congratulate you on that <laughs> you, 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 you placed uh, uh, three recommendations, you, you 2, 3 and 38. Uh, recommendation 2, 3 and 38. Could I ask you maybe to expand a bit on recommendation 38 um, uh, and how that might be achieved? Uh, and if I could ask you, recommendation 16... Um, which speaks about the potential of moving towards a model whereby it commissions sixth form places on an area basis, and indeed what the implications for the area planning uh, might be in, in, in that recommendation. Okay, Mr Newton, thank you very much. Um, the, the first one, recommendation 38, is about the, the teacher exemption. Yeah. and. Uh, all we were simply doing was taking up the report of the Equality Commission in 2004 and then repeated in 2014 and saying that uh, they say that uh, this exemption should be removed, that it, that it, that it is unhelpful and that it's against uh, the, the, the policy of the Equality Commission and the Fair Employment legislation. So they, in 2004 they said it should be done at post-primary level and my understanding is that it's very little used uh, at post primary level uh, and excuse me there were um, there was a presentation uh, by the Council for Catholic Retained Schools to your education committee uh, several years ago and the, the then chief executive of CCMS and a colleague both said that they did not need or want uh, the exemption uh, at post primary level, I mean, my, my understanding is that that is not quite the policy of, of uh, CCMS board, but it's, it's on the record for, uh, for them saying it. And um, it's, it's, the recommendation is not, of course, to the Department of Education, it's to the executive itself, uh, uh, and, and that it would be the office of the executive that would uh, have to respond to it. It's, it's, it's not in your jurisdiction. And that would mean simply that teachers uh, would be included in fair employment legislation and schools would be, empl- would be in- included in it. So it would, it would mean that there would be a greater uh, opportunity for mixing at staff level. And I've long held the view that if you, if you mix the staff in a school, a whole lot of other things flow from that. Uh, um, I remember Professor John White many years ago, both Queen's and UCD, saying that the problem about having separate education was was the the unspoken agenda, and that was just the assumptions. Um, the, 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 different things would not be challenged in different schools. Different comments in a staff room in one school would not be challenged in a, in a or would be challenged in another school. But because we live in such separate bubbles all the time. Uh, that it's important to break that and all we were doing in the report was saying we, we accept and support and encourage uh, the executive to uh, remove that um, 
exemption of, of teachers. Uh, your uh, uh, recommendation 16 then, that was taken from, uh, uh, that was copied from the recommendations of the, the Salisbury report, Sir Robert Salisbury, a few years ago, uh, who said that the department should consider moving towards a model where all school, you, you, that you would have the independent sixth form colleges, uh, basically, and that these would cater for all people within the area. Now, a whole lot of schools would have difficulties with that because uh, uh, the, the per capita budget that they get for sixth formers is, is enormously important to a whole lot of schools. But from an education point of view and from a community point of view, we endorsed Sir Bob Salisbury's uh, recommendation. That's what it was. And your question then about what that would do for area planning. Uh, the, the problem with area planning at the moment is, uh, and, and it's, it's one of the things that uh, has been raised more than once, it has been, uh, it has been raised either in your committee or on the, on the assembly floor, that uh, a problem has been that the, the education planning is operating in silos and that to date the controlled sector has been uh, rationalising itself and the Catholic maintained sector has been rationalising itself. And, uh, also, University, uh, who were mentioned earlier on, they, they, they re put out a report some time ago showing, for example, that there were 32 pairs of schools in rural areas which were close to each other, within, within sometimes just within yards or a mile of each other, and, and more than three miles away from other schools of the same sector. And that they were saying, would it not be useful for the local community and for the children in those schools to form one integrated or jointly managed school uh, in, in that in that village, as they, as they mostly were, rather than uh, do it on a sectoral basis. So th that remains a problem. But um, area area planning is not working as well as one might have hoped, uh, and the, this is something that they would have to take out, uh, as recommended by the Salisbury committee. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Robin. Dan, Daniel McCarson, MLA. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Colm. You're very welcome to the committee, and thank you for your presentation. Um, Colm, uh, uh, just in relation to growth in integrated schools, it's been very limited with the number of uh, transition schools having relatively low numbers of pupils from the minority community. But why do you think, Colm, uh, changing the religious balance criteria currently set out as low as 10%? of the minority community to a balance that reflects the religious balance of the community and the school uh, serves as, as an appropriate way forward? And would this not permit a school to operate with a religious balance as low as 1% in some situations? And surely this sort of religious mix would make the concept of integrated education meaningless. It's a bit of a challenge question, but I just, I'm just interested by that. Yeah, um, the, the first recommendation was uh, done on the basis of what was being reported to us from the Northern Ireland Council for Integrated Education and the Integrated Education Fund, uh, that there, there are quite a lot of parents now who do not want to uh, adopt any religious label at all, uh, and, and children of mixed marriages are, uh, have, have to decide whether they are Catholic or Protestant, in, in, the, in that term of mixed marriage, and there are an increasing number of people who are neither Catholic or Protestant coming into the community, so they wanted uh, to review the existing legal definition of integrated education to say, to say that it, what, was dis, what was defined in 1989 is now no longer appropriate 40 years later, 30, 30 years later, uh, in the light of the change. Thing. But I absolutely take your point, uh, and I would refer back to my comment that um, if you have mixed staff in a school, then everything changes, the, 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 the atmosphere changes, and what, what, what is talked about changes and how it's talked about changes that where you have where you have mixed an adult where you have a mixed adult group in the school the 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 conversation changes and that and that impacts on the, on the children but there there are areas in northern ireland where it would be extremely difficult to have an integrated school as at present where you have a, a, a controlled school with no or very few Catholics in it, or a Catholic maintained school with no or very few Protestants in it. And there are some areas in Northern Ireland which are going to happen. I remember when we were trying to 
a supportive group of parents in, in Carrick Fergus that opened Eulidia College, the, the Department of Education, seven times refused to approve it on the grounds that they thought they would never have a balance. So you're absolutely right to pinpoint an issue, but if we had if we had a united system, then uh, some of those some of those difficulties just disappear. Okay, uh, you mentioned area planning earlier. Uh, why do you believe area planning uh, processes constrains growth in integrated education, Colin? Well, to date, it has been done, as has been said in the assembly, it has been done in silos. The, 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 the uh, control sector is making itself more efficient uh, by uh, amalgamating or closing down smaller schools, and the Catholic Montaigne sector is, is doing the same. Um, there, there is no uh, uh, suggestion, and it's one of the recommendations that we have made, I can give you the number, um, that um, recommendation 11, that all development proposals for closures or amalgamations of existing schools should be required to demonstrate explicitly that they have given meaningful consideration to an integrated, jointly managed, that jointly Catholic Protestant Church managed, or a shared proposal. Um, uh, that, that within the sectors, that within the big sectors that we have now, that option is not seriously considered and we've asked that it should be. Okay. And uh, also, can you advise in general terms, Colin, what you believe the actual unmet demand for integrated education is and how many additional places or new integrated schools or preschools would be needed? Well, if you, if you take the, um, again, the Northern Ireland Statistical Research Agency's report of last year, November last year, uh, they said that 68% of respondents wanted mixed religion schools, so two-thirds of the population and they even break that down, 65% of Catholics and 68% of Protestants and 75% of people with no religion who responded said that they wanted. So that would indicate that, that, that the, the trend that those parents started in 1981 will, will just keep going, that there is an increasing uh, demand for it. There's a preference for it. But I remember when <laughs> they talk about herding cats, I'm trying to get difficult uh, people with different views together. I must say I found when, when we we're doing this report it was like herding steamrollers. They're, they're enormous situations, they're enormous institutions at the moment and just this, the inertia of the status quo but to try to change that. But governments have tried as I say three times over the last 200 years to do it and, it, and now the job falls to the, uh, into the lap of yourselves and the education committee and the assembly as a whole. Yeah, uh, and, and thank you for that. I'm ju just wondering as well, wh why, why do you think that 9% of your places are empty? Uh, there, one of the things that we did with, uh, uh, when we spoke to the um, Education Authority, Mr. Gavin Boyd was the Chief Executive at the time, and I always remember him saying that we did ourselves, the, the Integrated Schools Movement did itself no favour by allowing failing schools to try to be integrated as a last resort. And there are certainly occasions where that has happened. Um, and once a school is in that kind of serious decline, parents don't want to get into it. Uh, and, that's, and that's a major part of that reason. Also, there, there are areas where, um, I can think of one area where an integrated school opened and three years was funded out entirely by the Integrated Education Fund. And it closed because people in that area were not going to, were not going to go to it. Yeah, no, and I thank you for your honesty in that, Con, because I had looked at the schools that were failing that were moving towards more integration for about saving the schools as opposed to actually uh, integrated education. Just a, a, of another point, I know the chair is going to hammer me here shortly on time, but the independent report refers to a previous Equality Commissioner view of the religious designation of teachers uh, in uh, mainland, maintained and controlled schools. The Equality Commission based its findings on a sample of schools as the Department of Education does not gather statistics on the religious background of teachers. Come. The independent report recommends changes and a review uh, of the FETO exemptions for schools. Do you think that the Department of Education should undertake 100% audit of teachers in order to determine their religious background and the true level of inclusion amongst teaching staff in all of our schools? And finally, would it be a desirable thing uh, to have a training program in diversity and inclusion for new and existing teachers in order to ensure that the culture of schools is welcoming for all sectors of our community? Well, oh, you asked several different questions there at the same time. Um, you, you say, say it, Colin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
the, the last one, what our recommendation was that in 37 that all student teachers being educated here should have substantial meaningful cross-community professional training including cross-community contact so yes and to encourage uh, the schools to do to do that that, that was uh, part of the reason for the, the, removing it from the fair employment legislation um, the the first part um, if schools if the teacher exemption from fair employment was removed then currently all all Companies, as it are, is now, with more than is it 15 or 25 people, have to do an annual return to the uh, Equality Commission about their staffing, and that and that would do the job. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that, Daniel. That's you. Time up. Uh, is Robbie with us yet? Should be. Robbie Butler. Yes, sir. Sure. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say against the, the, the grim dining this morning because I wasn't leaving Stormont after three last night, so I was really late. So, Colin, my apologies for missing the very start of your presentation, but thank you so much for the, for the piece that I got in a bit. I probably came in when you were given the potted history of the, the failures uh, to tackle this over um, more than a century and a half, uh, and there's certainly value in trying to pursue uh, this together, even if we're not agreeing on 100% of the, the, the ideals. Um, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, Colin, but I don't think I'll take my full seven minutes. Um, for, first one um, is, is a short one. Um, special schools have been uh, to the fore of the committee's business now for um, this, this mandate. Um, so special schools are mostly designated as controlled, but as the report indicates that they're often super mixed. Um, with more than 30% from minority communities. Do you think the East Coast should be allowed to designate as in the Well, um, if we check that question now. Um, the, 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 the Department of Education has always said that because an integrated school has to meet a designated balance of majority and minority, that to bring that into the arena of a special school could cut across the reason for the special school being in existence, and so the department has always said that they shouldn't, they shouldn't do it. Okay. Um, am, I, am I clear there, yeah? Um, no, okay, well, I think you can even just flesh that out a little bit more, because it, to me, <laughs> you made it to break it down a little bit more for me, but no, I don't actually understand that, to be fair. Okay, if you, if you have to have, the department says not less than 30% of the minority community in an area within 10 years of becoming a uh, a transforming school, uh, so they would say that if in a particular area only 10% of the people came from that minority tradition, then it would not meet the criteria for being an integrated school. And so okay. the department has repeatedly said that that could not be allowed to happen because that would undermine the very purpose for, for a special school being a special school. But you're absolutely right, the, in, in effect, uh, they have always been super mixed. Okay, and as a policy, do, would, do you think that's a, that's a reasonable policy that the department have, Colm? The, 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 the well-being of the children in the special schools gets priority. I think that in most cases they would actually just meet it on a de facto basis. But I would, I would hate to be juggling with the designation of a school uh, in any way that would disadvantage any of the children who should be in it. Okay, no, no problem. Um, the, the Department of Shared Education and Community Relations, Equality and Diversity Policies are designed to improve relations between communities by educating children and young people from different backgrounds and traditions to develop self-respect and respect for others and to promote equality and to work to eliminate discrimination by providing formal and non-formal education opportunities that build relationships. Do you think that shared education projects will lead to greater informal and formal integration of the Northern Ireland school system? Uh, well, yes, in theory. I mean, that's what everybody believes, and that's why the government's putting two hundred eighty-five million pounds into it over over that six-year period that I mentioned. Um, y yes, we're absolutely better having shared education than not having shared education. But I think the the difference between shared education, which is limited contact between a limited number of children over a limited period, uh, is is just so much less wonderful than having children sitting beside each other in the desk all the time. Uh, so, so it's it's better than not having it, but it's not anything like as good as having children sitting together in the same schools all the time and mixing up the adults. It's just, it's better for the children. It's better for the community. Uh, um, just as I noted, I'll just ask one, one, one last one, if that's okay. Um, 
So uh, I know that the, the report, and for years we've picked up and we've used language which sometimes isn't helpful, but because we, we measure it in terms of whether it's from a Protestant background, a Catholic background, or neither. But the reality is that it's not about that religious thing. We put badges on it instead of talking about faith. So the Christian thought extends across, regardless of whether you're Christ, you're, you're, you call yourself Protestant, Catholic, or neither, or, or, or other. Um, with regard to then this, the, the, trying to establish like a, a, a joint faith school, um, can you indicate how they would be managed? Um, for you know, to to respect people's diverse faith within this environment. Yeah. Well, for, firstly, I, I, the very thing. I mean, I, we use a religious label for what is largely not a theological issue at all in Northern Ireland. It's about it's yeah. about identity and nationalism and, and, and opposing nationalism. Um, but they, I, I've done quite a lot of work uh, of research about the joint church schools. I don't know if you're here when I mentioned that I edited the first international directory of joint Protestant Catholic, Roman Catholic schools, colleges and universities in 2007, and we're bringing out a new one uh, now in the new year, published by NICE. Um, and they, they, you have, in, in those cases, essentially, uh, people from the Roman Catholic tradition coming together with people from various Protestant traditions, and they do it by agreement, and to use the the expression of a teacher in Australia, a principal in Australia, that we build on what we have in common. Um, mm -hmm. or, or a principal in England saying uh, the Anglican children are no less Anglican and the Roman Catholic children are no less Roman Catholic, but they both understand and appreciate each other and understand each other better what does it. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's uh, obviously a sensitive thing. And it's not, it has to be done by people who want to do it. That's the issue. Yeah. Um, they, there's only one example on this island. That's a school in County Leash, uh, a little community school. Um, but otherwise, what, what the, we've, we've done that, and most of these schools are in England, and most of them would be Anglican and Roman Catholic coming together. But there are also examples of other of, of Quakers in in Australia. There's a lot of the United Reformed Church uh, involvement in doing it. Uh, those can only happen where people want to do it. You can't you can't force. Uh, that, but the leadership, if uh, if it's coming from within the churches, then it can happen. Okay, listen, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Robbie. Is William there, Clark? No. Okay. Uh, Justin McNulty. Thank you, Chair. Hi, Colin. Thanks very much for coming before the committee today. Uh, your presentation is detailed, um, inspired, and with powerful rationale. Um, and I cannot help but think today of your city's and Ireland's greatest son, the late John Hume. He placed a huge value in education, which was about more than labels. He taught us that a good education can unlock potential, elevate people out of poverty, and help with people with aspirations, the aspirations of people and communities. And he was the reconciler from the start. When others were maiming and murdering, he was reconciling. Um, can I ask a couple of things? You've highlighted the work in shared education versus integrated education. Do you think shared education is an admission that integrated education, while successful in some areas, is difficult to sell in other areas? Um, I, I think for a lot of people, it's easier to, for everybody, it's easier to have shared education than to try and uh, change the whole structure of education uh, across Northern Ireland. Um, and it's better than not having it, but as I said, it, it, it's like the gold standard is to have all the children in the same school all the time and not be depending on, on, on subsidy to, to do that. So, but it, the, the, the precise answer to your question then, is it an admission? Um, I'm not sure whether you said it was an admission of, of reluctance or admission of failure, but um, it, it, shared education is easy uh, to add on to the existing structures. Integrated education requires significant change. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Um, Colin, if, to... if, I, if I could quote Darwin, it's not the, it's not the uh, strongest who survive or the fastest who survive, but the people who are, who are most open to change. Okay, in terms of, I loved your metaphor earlier, Colin, where you, you mentioned herding steamrollers. 
and the inertia of the status quo, right? We've heard a lot about no return to the status quo, but in my mind, the status quo is very much returning the stomach back to the same old ways, as was evidenced by the, the, the opposition to bringing through more transparency in the chamber yesterday. And um, so the status quo has returned. Um, can you give me a view in terms of how the status quo can be exploded in a powerful, positive way to prevent the, the, the continuance of the inertia between the two blocks, which is hold us all back and hold us back in education? How can that inertia be broken down? Well, uh, Ambassador Rees said it was up to the lawmakers and the churches and civic society. Um, there's, uh, there's a lovely anecdote, which I think of from time to time, a person went in to talk to President Lyndon Johnson when he was the President of the United States. And they went into the Oval Office and they, and they buttonholed him for 15 minutes. And at the end of that, Johnson said, OK, I absolutely accept your argument. You've completely convinced me. Now go out and force me to act. So I would ask yourselves on the committee, how can we in the civic community outside, civic society, help you to bring the changes that you want? And in this case, how can we uh, increase the, the 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 public support for the the major changes specifically in, in what we're talking about today in terms of uh bringing together two parallel school systems your the budget that, that you're scrutinizing every year is two billion pounds and we spent most of that sorry we spent most of a billion on the control sector and most of a billion on the catholic maintained sector and and then we spent 285 million pounds trying to get them to contact and any any accountant would tell you that that's that's the economics of fantasy land. Would you not would you not get them into one system? Um, so if I'm I, I will do what I can in the outside world to keep the issue on the agenda and to encourage people to make change. Uh, I, I'm I will shortly send each of the members of your committee a copy of Jonathan Barton's book, the uh, the struggle for shared schools in Northern Ireland. Shared schools is what they used to call integrated schools before it, before shared was given a different label. Um, but I, I will do it on the outside uh, and support and encourage the, the MLAs who want to make the change inside. Okay. In order to overcome the opposition to the growth of the integrated education column, do you think that, um, as NACI indicated in 2016, there is a need for a patent style inquiry to degenerate to, to sorry desegregate schooling here and to take into public ownership all publicly funded schools uh, well uh, you can imagine the the issues that are that, 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 that would raise and the complications of doing it to get the community to want to do it um but according to the own the statistics research agency two-thirds of the population wants it to happen they want that to happen they may not have thought of how you get from where you are now to get to that situation, but that's uh, th that's the job. Um, I've spent several decades at this work myself, just as a volunteer, and uh, it, I mean, it's coming. It's coming, and it will continue to come. The, the The issue, I suppose, is how we can assist members of the assembly who want to make it happen uh, to to assist and encourage them to 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 to, make, to create that change in society, and. You, your predecessors in 1831 and in 1924 uh, came up with uh, theological issues about it, really. Um, theology, and I, I suspect politics as well. And then in 1974, uh, in the power sharing executive, when, when your own also unionist SDLP and the Alliance Party were in it, the Ulster Workers' Council strike stopped that, which has nothing to do with education, but that, uh, that meant the programme for government disappeared. So, the outside world working with the elected representatives is, is the way we do it. You are the people who have the legal power to do it. Well, you, your words are inspiring, Colin, and you no know better person to help us, to lead us along the way, and you're, you're doing that exceptionally uh, positively and powerfully, so I commend you on that, Colin. These cred uh, policies are designed to improve relations between our communities by educating children from different backgrounds to develop self-respect and respect for others, to promote, to promote equality and to work to eliminate discrimination. Do you think the shared education project will lead to greater formal and informal integration on our school system? Uh, well, everyone hopes yes, and the results of from the departments, the Department of Education has to submit a report every year to the Assembly. And if you look at the report in 2016 and in 2018, they, they show 
uh, graphs of the reaction of people and how much how many people have made friendships or some people there's always people who's uh, it's encouraging if you if you if you look at the results of the people who take part in shared education but i think it was your own party leader who said that the the big doubt about um uh, shared education is that if the government stopped giving the 285 million pounds will the schools continue to do it who would pay for substitute teacher who pays the bus fare to get children from one place to another to another school and get them back in those are the issues so it has to be subsidized in order to do it whereas if the children are under the same roof and this behind the same desk at the time it happens anyway okay the final question the two-thirds of the population column want to see integrated education why do they vote as they do I, I don't have to ask you why the people of Northern Ireland uh, don't wish the way that you don't vote the way that you would like them to vote. It's um, there's most most people most people just make do and get on. They're, they're concerned about putting bread on the table in the morning. They're concerned about getting to work. They're concerned about their health, and they're not they're, they're, the population of Northern Ireland doesn't sit down every morning and say, "I wonder how we can do about the education system today or about anything else." So a lot of people, it's, as, as I say, it's that phrase, the inertia of the status quo, just it works. It was OK for my father and mother. It'll be OK for me. There are other things that are more pressing issues. But um, if, if we had tomorrow a united school system, I think there'd be very few people who say, no, no, I want to go back again. I don't like this system. I want to go back to the other. But m m most people, as, as any elected representatives know, have, have a plethora of things on their mind apart from the policy issues that the elected representative has on his or her mind. Well, maybe sometime in the future, Colm, we'll have a sunning deal for slow learners moment where we can say we got there eventually. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Thanks, Justin. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Morris, Morris Bradley. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, apologies, Colm, for missing the start of your, your presentation, but I got enough of it, and I can assure you that <laughs> I would be a supporter of integrated education, a strong supporter, but certainly, certainly not in its current form, which I believe is wrong. Uh, I've always believed in the, in the power of sport to break down barriers. If we can play together, we can live together, it used to be my mantra. But we can easily jump that into education. If we can learn together, uh, then we can live together as well. Uh, in my opinion, all schools should be integrated, and we do not need another tier of education in the country. Uh, could I ask what would be the benefits of one education system with a shared curriculum and all existing sectors merging into one sector? What would be the benefits of one shared system? That, that would be what I'm working for. That I have no difficulty how, how it's operated, how it's structured, who's, who's, what, what, what it's called, uh, or who manages it, but get the children into the same place. I think we're, you're pushing an open door. I mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, I have no difficulty with it. Yeah, well, and I apologise if you've already covered that in your presentation that I must say something I, I feel strongly about. Uh, and also, uh, Colin, what would be the financial benefits to the Education Authority? You, you partially answered that question to Justin of the simple breakdown of cost, but what would be the financial benefits? Well, I, I don't know if you were here when I talked about the £57 million. Uh, no. Th there, were two, th there, were, there were two professional estimates done of the cost of Northern Ireland running a, 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 a divided education system, two parallel systems. And sorry, they, they, there were two surveys done of the whole, the cost of division as a whole. One was done by uh, Deloitte for the Northern Ireland office in 2007, and one, one was done by Ulster University in 2016. Um, and they, well, the political situation had changed quite a lot between 2007 and 16, and the overall picture was, was very different. But interestingly, in both cases, uh, Deloitte and the economists in the Ulster University Economic Policy Centre both came to, a figure, to two figures that were very close to each other. And that was, if you, if you, if they were both said it was about 50 million pounds a year. One said 54 million, and one said 58 million, I think. But if you, if you, if you look for a median cost uh, the, be, between the two of them, um, then the the what what these professional economists say, having looked at the the structures of education and the costs of education and where money is spent in education, uh, they say that uh, the median the median issue would be 
57 and a quarter million pounds every year. Now you have to get to that, of course. You've got a whole lot of school buildings that are duplicated at the moment. And, and that's only a median cost. The Ulster University people said it could be as low as 14 million saving, or it could be as big as 92 million saving. But if you, but that's where I, that's where I base that figure on. So that's more than a million pounds a week, and that's only between two and three percent of the Department of Education budget every year presently. But over a period, of, the figure that I quoted was: if you take that from the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, 1998, that's one and a quarter billion pounds. And every week you have people coming to you looking for more money in various sectors in education. But but that's a million pounds a week that that the professional economists say we would be saving if we had a single unified system, whatever it's called, whoever manages it. Mm -hmm. Just one final one, uh, Chair, with your patience. Morris, go ahead, yeah. Well, I, I believe that segregation has actually been kept alive by politics, which by nature itself uh, is divisive. In your experience, is there a political will, never mind within the education system, for real meaningful change throughout Northern Ireland? Do you think our politicians, myself included, have the backbone we actually get this over the line. Can, can I give you an answer to that? There's, there's a quote that I have, and if, if you let me read it, and it was by a, a good friend of Northern Ireland, uh, Senator George Mitchell, uh, who to this day is still uh, involved in, in issues in Northern Ireland. And he wrote a, a book called Making Peace, the inside story of the making of the Good Friday Agreement, published in 1999. And it's a really interesting quote because it's said by a sympathetic outsider and he said, Northern Ireland is an advanced modern society. Its people are productive, literate, articulate. But for all its modernity and literacy, Northern Ireland has been divided by a deep and ancient hatred into two hostile communities, their enmity burnished by centuries of conflict. They have often inflicted hurt, physical and psychological, on members of the other community, and they've been quick to take offense at real or perceived slights. They have a highly developed sense of grievance. Each is a minority. Each sees itself as a victim community, constantly under siege, the recipient of a long litany of violent blows from the other. And then subsequently in the book he says, I wondered how it was possible to have two such completely different views of the same society. So that's, that's a person who's very sympathetic to Northern Ireland and who has spent years trying to work for the benefit of society here. Uh, and I think the key to that is each is a minority. Uh, the minority rights group used to publish documents, uh, reports on various parts of the world. And, uh, and one of their very earliest books was called about Northern Ireland, the problem of the double minority. And that is that each, each the, the unionist community would be a minority in the United Ireland, the nationalist community is a minority in the United Kingdom. And uh, it's that continual struggle and it, we use a religious label for it, but it's really, it's really conflicting identities, British or Irish or nationalism. Um, I think we kind of work at it. I think that the, the, the assembly of which you have the honor to be an elected representative both shows the difficulties of it that we can have no assembly for three years because of difference and it also shows the the wish of people like yourselves and the other members of the committee and of the assembly floor um, to try and find a, try and find a way forward um, but we have that we, we, we let ourselves be pulled in two different directions the only the final word I would say on it is that um, you'll be aware that the, the public opinion polls show that there are now three groups in Northern Ireland. There are the people who identify strongly as British and Unionist, people who identify strongly as Irish and Nationalist. But there's now this very large group in the middle who say, no, no, we're neither. And those are the people who will, who will have the casting vote in the future of Northern Ireland. And, and those are the people, uh, if you look at that again, the, the statistics for people who wanted uh, mixed religion school for their children. The, the highest percentage was the people of no religion. 75% of them wanted it. Um, so I think, I think there's hope. I think that, that you and the people around the table with you, um, or the people at home with, uh, with you this morning, that you're the people who show the leadership and the, and the words that you've said would, I would regard as hopeful and inspiring as well, that we, we can work together and we should work together. I can give you dozens of quotations of people along those lines about reconciliation, but but yes, uh, the future is there if we have it. And just w one final thing, and that is that the report actually had uh, fostering innovation in our schools. 
And there was a lovely uh, uh, comment, probably one of was innovation centres uh, for people to learn skills in an in, in enterprising centre. And the quote was from the then director of Catalyst Inc, uh, Steve Orr, um, uh, at Queen's University, if we make the change to education, we will rule the world. That's the kind of inspiration we need. Thank you very much, Colin. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Morris. Thank you, Mr. Riley. Thanks. Just before I round up, folks, uh, Robin just wanted a very brief final question there. Yeah. Yes. Thank you, Chair. And I, I opened my remarks by saying it was a very easily read report, and uh, it is. But perhaps you would comment. I'm trying to find within it where there's uh, the mention to uh, those who wish to be educated and immersed in the Irish language and how they might be facilitated within an integrated system. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, 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 where there are more than one language in society, this is always an issue. Um, I, I have some experience of it from, from Canada between the, the French-speaking and the English-speaking people. You know the people in Wales, the, the Welsh-speaking people and the English-speaking people, and in Scotland, uh, again, the, the, the small number of people who speak Gaelic, etc. There's an issue there. Uh, I, 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 I'm not quite sure how you tackle it, um, but uh, I, I'd be happy to, to look at that specific question. What we did in the report was really look at, at society as a whole. The, if, if people wish and they have the right to be educated in their native language, um, then Western society says you have the right to do that. And um, how, how you connect them. Interestingly, um, th this issue arose many years ago, about 19, early 1990s, when there were people in Derry, Londonderry, who wanted to start a, 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 an Irish medium post-primary school. And they asked one of the, they, they approached the people connected with Upgrove Integrated College and they said, could we somehow connect with yourselves? And we said, well, the requirement that we have is that there must be a balance of the community in the school. So if you can guarantee that, then, then we could bring the discussion forward. But given the nature of Northern Ireland, they couldn't. Although, in fact, the first little girl who was uh, who got a, uh, the, the, fir the first O level or A level in, in Irish at Oak Grove College was, in fact, a little uh, Protestant girl who did it at the end of first year because she had had been to an, an Irish medium school, but it's it's a real issue how you how you include people who speak a different language uh, in the in the mainstream and not let them become isolated and in in a in a bubble of their own. There, there's you you raise a really serious issue, Mr. Newton. I absolutely agree. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Against all better judgment, Daniel McCrossan has asked for a brief supplementary. Daniel. Don't let me die. He'd not be as brief as I was. Yeah, I'm timing him. Go. Chair, uh, Chair thank you very much for uh, indulging me. And also, I just want to put on record my thanks to Colin because I did find this presentation very, very interesting. And there are huge challenges. And it does show how far we've come, Chair, when I hear Mr. Newton defend the Irish language and share his concerns for today. And I'm delighted <laughs> on the path we're headed. So uh, I just want to put on record my, my thanks. <laughs> question, Daniel? Or is that you? That's... <laughs> is that you first, Daniel? Yeah. I am, yes. Okay, thanks. Um, Colin, uh, I, I obviously have to balance my role as chair as well as being an, an Alliance Party MLA, but um, for the avoidance of any doubt, um, from an Alliance Party perspective, we, um, the report is welcome. Um, we, we obviously have a long-standing position um, that for an education system to separate children <coughs> at, as young as five on the basis of community or religious background is socially and financially flawed. Um, and our position is, is long-standing work towards an integrated system of education um, where children um, of different backgrounds and abilities are all educated together. So I, I welcome the report and I, I welcome the commitment in the new decade, new approach um, for the independent review of education um, to consider a single education system based on children and young people of different background in the classroom together. Um, interestingly as well, Colin, the, 
uh, you alluded to many other previous reports that have made recommendations in relation to integrated education. What, one of the clearest was the Fresh Start panel report on the disbandment of paramilitary groups in Northern Ireland in May 2016, which says the executive should set ambitious targets and milestones to measurably reduce segregation in education as quickly as possible. Um, we have the Department of Education briefing us next. Your report was 2015, is that correct? Yeah. 2016. 2016. Okay. As was the fresh fresh start panel. So we're four years on. What what is your assessment of the implementation of your report? The implementation of clear recommendations like that of the fresh start panel that said ambitious targets and milestones to measurably reduce segregation in education as quickly as possible. What what's your assessment of the Education, the Department of Education, indeed the executive's implementation of your recommendations and, and the recommendations of other reports in relation to tackling <coughs> that segregation and promoting integrated education? Uh, well, I, I think the department could do much more uh, than it has done, but the, the, I suppose the, the prim primary issue is that, is that very first one I mentioned again, that the department does not have a duty to promote integrated education the way it has a duty to promote shared education and um, and also to report every two years on, on progress to the assembly so if those two uh, if that if, if they were responsible for promoting it uh, then I think it would it would clarify the issue and would, and would help them to set targets and but they would have to set targets that uh, you and, and your colleagues in the assembly uh, can drive forward and hope, and hope to meet. Um, I, I know, but then there, there are a whole lot of things in the report that are, that are kind of technical issues as well that the department could do. That um, removing financial incentives to shared education partnerships that actually want to go further uh, and, and combine, uh, and, uh, and uh, where a development proposal is approved uh, for a new integrated school, that there shouldn't be a capital viability period. That would be recommendations 13 and 28, uh, where there's clear demand for an integrated preschool provision. Uh, that it should receive funding. Uh, that's recommendation eight. Even if uh, there are vacancies in other places, it's like if a child wants to go to a Catholic school, they're not told it's okay. There's no space here, but you can go to that control school. Or if a child wants to go to a control school, they're not told. Not told. Sorry, we can't take you, but you can go there. But but every year, hundreds of children are turned away uh, from post primary schools in Northern Ireland. I think six or seven hundred. Uh, in the most recent figures, and they're told away, and they're just told, sorry, there's no, there's no space in the sector that you ask, uh, so just go to another sector because you're too far away from, uh, from any alternative. So uh, I think the, the question is, does your committee, does the Department of Education, does, sorry, does the Assembly want to have integrated education, and if they want to have it, we'll find a way, we'll find a way. Okay, and let me, let, just to supplement that question briefly, Colm, then, I'd, I could talk to you about the recommendations all day, but you, had, you, you focus in on a couple. Um, and recommend, recommendation two, that recommendation that the Department of Education brings forward legislation to place a duty on the Department of Education uh, and the Education Authority and a power on all arm's length bodies to encourage, facilitate and promote integrated education. It, it's my understanding that the Department of Education um, has has not actioned that recommendation and has potentially stated that it's the role of NICE to progress that recommendation, despite reference to legislation. Have you had feedback from the Minister of Education, no. the Department of Education, um, on on any of the recommendations, but particularly those that you've highlighted as most important? No, we haven't. The, the reason I highlighted those three at the start is that they require legislative change. Other, a whole lot of other things the department can do uh, within it, within its own regulatory uh, framework. Um, but for 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 that one, legislation is required to add the word promote, uh, as it did with shared and edu shared education. And when the shared education act was going through, uh, or the bill at that stage was going through the assembly. The issue was raised by an MLA to, that the Shared Education Act was going to encourage, facilitate and promote shared education. And they said, they asked that the education reform order 
be amended by including the word act as well or put it into the into the shared education act and they just uh, and the response from the uh, in the assembly debate was no no that's that's a separate issue we're, we're just talking about shared education here i mean it could be done but it requires it requires legislative change to to do that and to ask the, the department of education to have a a, a a twice a two yearly report on progress just as the issue about um, fair employment legislation requires legislative change by the executive office um, I have not had response from the, the uh, Department of Education um, about about any of those issues. Uh, okay. You are you are the the first people to ask me for a formal discussion, to ask us for a formal discussion, myself and Professor Topping. Wait, so the Department of Education hasn't hasn't met with you to discuss these recommendations? Uh, there, there was. There was discussion uh, uh, at a very early stage when he gave in the report and we met the minister and that, but, but after that, uh, no they have not come back to us then. No. Okay. In terms of um, recommendation 38, um, that um, there should be a repeal of the exemption of teachers from fair employment and treatment legislation. That is a responsibility for the executive office. Have you had any indication that the executive <laughs> office is working to bring forward legislation to repeal the exemption of teachers from fair employment and treatment well, legislation, which I, I am shocked still has not been addressed? Uh, well, the simple answer is no, but we did our uh, report uh, at the request of uh, Minister O'Dowd, as it then was the Minister of Education, and then the Minister Weir was the person who was Minister when we gave in the report. We did not have direct dealings with the Executive Office. Okay. Well, look, my, uh, for another forum, but I, my colleague Kelly Armstrong is working on uh, legislation with relation, in relation to integrated education, and, and I'm uh, scoping legislation in relation to FIDO as well. But um, the committee is extremely grateful for your presentation today, Colin. Um, thank the members for their, their questions and for your responses in such a timely manner, given our, our, our tight schedule. Um, and certainly we'll, we'll look to remain in contact with you as we look to um, progress a, a, a more integrated education system in Northern Ireland. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Little and, and all the members. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. Okay, Clark, um, do you want to summarise any uh, actions. You want to go on, Chairperson, to the next uh, meeting, then we could uh, we'll summarise afterwards. Okay, no problem. Do I have our, our witnesses with us, Clark? Yeah. Do, yeah. Okay, that's great then. Members, we'll move to agenda item six, which is our oral briefing uh, on the Integrated Education Independent Review Report from the Department of Education. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and to add the witnesses? and refer members to a note from the committee clerk at page 280, an updated briefing paper from the department at page 284, a copy of uh, AQW 8325 at page 292, and previous correspondence relating to Fresh Start at page 293. Can I welcome the following witnesses? Alison Chambers, Director of Promoting Collaboration and Tackling Disadvantage at the Department of Education. Shirley Sweeney, Head of Irish Medium and Integrated Education at the Department of Education, and David Gibson, Irish Medium and Integrated Education Team at the Department of Education. You're very welcome, and by way of welcome, can I say there are a number of education reviews uh, planned, um, progressed or underway, including the New Decade, New Approach, Independent Review of Education, uh, the review of SEA's grade awarding process, the underachievement and deprivation review, and a planned review of the Education Authority. I anticipate that this committee will wish to follow up with these different pieces of work, and it is important for us to start as we mean to go on by following up on the findings of reports commissioned by the Department and finding out how the recommendations are to be taken forward with particular reference today to the independent review of integrated education. Um, can I advise officials um, that the committee will give them 10 to 15 minutes for an opening statement, followed by questions from the members. Hand over to you, Alison. 
Good morning, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, we're very pleased to come to talk to the committee today from the department's point of view about the independent review of in integrated education. And we would also like to record our thanks to Mr. Kavanagh and Professor Topping for the work that they've put into the review. It's relevant to note that whilst the report was published in March 2017, at this time it was for information only. The recommendations were not formally considered or accepted at ministerial level, and that engagement only took place once the Minister of Education had taken up post earlier this year. Um, committee will also appreciate that work for all in education has been significantly affected uh, since March of this year by the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. The 39 recommendations contained in the review of integrated education are wide ranging, covering many areas, and I thought it would be useful this morning um, to set out the areas where we have been able to progress work during the time between the report being published and the executive resuming. We are and will remain very mindful of meeting our statutory duty to encourage and facilitate the development of integrated education. And you will appreciate that in the absence of ministers and an executive, officials were not able to progress any recommendations impacting on legislation or policy. We work very closely with our colleagues uh, and representatives from our arm's length body, NICE, to prioritise the development of new updated guidance for schools seeking to transform to integrated status. Uh, this guidance sets out in a very practical manner clear information about the statutory requirements for transformation, best practice for guidance to parents, what the department will be looking for in terms of development proposals, support for branding and ongoing support for schools once they have transformed, recognising that this is the start of the next part of their journey rather than an end point and also setting out where schools can get more information and support and what we've heard from, from stakeholders and NICE and the IAF and practitioners is that this guidance is really welcome and very helpful. Um, we have from an area planning perspective, um, we're now very engaged with NICE as the body funded for and tasked with promoting the development of integrated education. There are a range of area planning groups that NICE is represented on and this means that early engagement and consideration of integrated solutions can be brought forward by them, as well as giving them the opportunity to influence the assessment of need uh, when any in in increases to integrated places are being considered. We also listen to stakeholders about supporting schools for a longer period of time once they had transformed, uh, and we have a fund which schools can now access for five years following transformation. Previously, that had been three. Um, this supports them in a, a range of practical ways. For example, schools have used this to engage with the local community, leading to good relations, increased admissions and enrolment numbers, uh, and better religious balance. Um, they've used it to provide continuous professional development to support teaching and non-teaching staff, build their capacity to contribute to the implementation of an integrated ethos, and review the curriculum through an integrated lens and develop pupil conversations often across religious and social divides. Um, they've used that fund to provide administrative support um, and to build working relationships with other integrated schools. We also now have a, a shared education and sectoral support team within the Education Authority and feedback from NICE is that this is a very helpful development providing positive points of contact and support for them and benefits for integrated schools in terms of joined up working. Within the department, we've taken the time over the past three and a half years and focused on developing how we work with NICE so that support is provided whenever it is needed on a range of practical queries at an organisational level. Uh, training is provided on requirements of central government, for example, on outcomes-based uh, outcomes accountability training, uh, business case training, um, and we also have our regular governance and accountability review meetings um, with the permanent secretary and our sponsor team um, who are here today, Shirley and David, um, meet monthly with NICE um, uh, and as needed, obviously. Um, and these meetings have continued, albeit remotely, throughout the pandemic. Um, we've taken forward development of a considerable capital program over the last three and a half years through the fresh start. Um, significant investment has been provided and committed to the integrated sector, and we're delighted to see the benefits this investment has brought to date and will bring in the coming years. We've progressed our shared education programme, which, although separate to integrated education, um, provides us with very useful qualitative information uh, about changing attitudes. 
Um, and since taking up post in January um, this year, the minister, like yourselves, has been very busy, but we engaged with him at an early stage of the year about the recommendations set out uh, in the Independent Review of Integrated Education. As part of that engagement, we have set out the recommendations in categories where progress has been made, uh, where we would not recommend taking forward certain recommendations, and where progressing the recommendations would best be taken forward as, the, as part of the forthcoming independent review of education as set out in the New Decade New Approach document. Your written briefing this morning um, provides where each recommendation sits within these categories. Um, and in summary, 11 recommendations have been actioned with a further two within NICE's remit to take forward. The Minister has agreed that a further 11 should not be taken forward. Uh, a number of these relate to fresh start capital funding, which has specific and set parameters. Others relate to the kite mark concept, which the sector would not consider the most effective means of celebrating integrated success. Still others relate to inspection and policy work that are not sector specific. Uh, and the minister has indicated his intention for the remaining 15 to be taken forward as part of the work relating to the independent review of education. So I hope this uh, is a useful starting point to set the context of what we have done to date and how we intend to progress the outstanding recommendations. Um, and we're happy to take any questions. Thank you. Can I bring in Karen <coughs> Mullen, MLA? Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you all for your uh, presentation this morning. And we heard earlier there from, from Colin uh, Kavna uh, in relation to all of the work around um, his report and, and review. Growth in the inter in integrated schools has been fairly limited, particularly in my own city. Um, what has the department done to am amend the area plan and policy in order to encourage and facilitate new integrated provision? Uh, and also I'd like to ask, is it, is it a sustainable policy that schools earmarked for closure can remain open if they transform to integrated status? Um, okay. Um, in terms of the area planning policy, I mean, that already has to take cognizance of the statutory duty um, to encourage and facilitate um, integrated education. So that's already built into the current process. Um, in terms of the policy on whether schools can remain open, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I'm going to pass to David to take that one. Yes, um, the the provision for schools to transform to integrated status is unique to to that sector, to the integrated sector, and legislation, as currently stated, allows any school, or from a, a special school, um, to transform to integrated status. Um, there have been a number of schools that, that have been on a plan, an area plan for closure, that have chosen um, to, to have a parental vote or a board of governors vote to move toward transformation into greater status. Um, that is allowed for in legislation as it currently stands, and the, the, the department has a duty to allow that to come forward and the decision to be taken um, in context with the other DP for closure of the school. David, thank you. I think it just it, it, it points to feelings for for parts of the area planning process. Um, you know, just thinking locally, we had a school. Um, it transferred. It was down for closure. Um, it transferred to integrated, um, and it has progressed and will be closing. So, it's just not good um, for the children that attend the school, the school community, the parents. When that when that happens, um, if the school is going to close anyway, so I know this is wider than than yourselves today, and it it forms the conversations that we're having around area planning. But thank you for that update. In the area pre earlier presentation, um, it just sort of finished there around the Irish medium, and um, uh, David, you, you would know that many Irish medium schools are independent and non-denominational, denominational like the one that I sent my children to, so naturally integrated. Um, so there's all our models that exist in the integrated sector in that relation. But just wanted to ask, is um, the founding definition of integrated education too narrow now to meet the needs of our increasingly diverse communities? 
the, well, sorry, sorry, the legislation, um, as my members will know, is written that integrated education is the education together at school of Protestant Catholics. Mm -hmm. um, th this is an issue that has been raised by NICE, um, of, of, of along the lines of those who don't designate as either of the two main traditions or who choose to designate as other. Um, the, the legislation is clear uh, on the, the integrated education and uh, integrated schools are defined in legislation have a particular setup, a particular board of governors, etc., uh, that makes them different or unique from other sectors. Um, but yes, we are also responsible for the Irish medium sector as well. And yes, it, it is it is it is fact that um, the Irish medium sector attracts children from both main traditions. Yeah, uh, if I may, as morning, um, if that recommendation um, from Colm and Margaret's report um, relating to the existing legal definition. Um, is, is among those that the Minister has agreed should be um, considered within the, the wider review of education. That's great. Thank you very much, Chair. That's me. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Robin Newton. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I, um, thank you to the panel for joining us uh, this morning. I've, I've just uh, one very short uh, question, really. Um, tell me, what is the gap between the provision of integrated education and the demand for integrated education? Um, well, in terms of um, first preference places, um, in our uh, most recent statistics, um, 471 children uh, were not provided with their first choice place in an integrated school. OK, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Robin. That, that data is gathered as part of the Executive Office Good Relation Indicators, Alison, is that right? Um, no, that data comes from um, our own internal statistics uh, in terms of um, admissions um, and applications for admissions. Okay. What, school admissions what, team, sorry, Chair, school admissions team would, would gather that for every school. Um, so they're, they're looking at the, the pattern across each sector in terms of first preference, final preference and final admissions. Okay, and what what percentage of applications is four hundred and seventy one? Do you know? Not off the top of my head, but we can get you that figure, chair. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Um, okay, Rob. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Rob. Can I bring in Daniel McCrossan? Yeah. Uh, thank you, chair, and uh, thank you to our guests in the department for their presentation. Um, I, I, I jump straight in. The, the independent review of integrated education commissioned by the department was undertaken by two people. One of those was the then president of NICE. Uh, how can you describe the review as independent in those circumstances? Um, I appreciate the question. Um, it predates my uh, arrival in this post, um, and um, I, I take your point. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it just it worries me a lot of things in, in uh, the Department of Education describes independent and when you scratch the surface they're not entirely independent and certainly this is an example uh, in that regard. Uh, I would like an answer to that though if you could get me some form of context as to how that happened um, beyond now. <clears throat> Yeah, we, we'll go back and we'll, we'll look at how the, the panel was recruited and, and write to you on that. Yeah, I just I just couldn't understand how that that happened. Thank you. Uh, can, can you tell us uh, why further research in respect of the differential outcomes for tolerance and reconciliation for the different school sectors here will not be taken forward? And uh, wouldn't such research inform the development of shared education and CRED as well as provide us with uh, a perspective on the different sectors? Um, it's not that the recommendation uh, is not being taken forward. Um, I think the recommendation, as it's as it's uh, stated, um, isn't been taken forward. But we'll, uh, as you point out, we already have research commissioned um, to look at attitudinal change with the Young Life and Times, Kids Life and Times, and specific commissioned pieces um, for shared education partnerships. Um, so I think it's a case that there's no need to take that recommendation forward. It's already been actioned. Oh, okay. Again, like that. That's an uncertain thing as well. So, just explain that again. So, 
he is aren't taking the recommendation as written forward, but he's are taking a recommendation forward. Is that? Is that... <laughs> <laughs> it's um, the, it's already been actioned. Um, I, I suppose you know it's there's no need for the recommendation because the action's already taking place. Put it okay. Like that. And again, when, can you provide me some clarification around that uh, when you are sending me out the detail? I just uh, I would like some more information on that if possible. Uh, okay, I have another four questions. Um, gro growth in integrated schools has uh, been fairly limited. The integrated sector contends that the needs model constrains development uh, of new integrated schools as this requires other sectors to sign off a new integrated provision. Uh, other people have a very different view as to why there has been such limited growth. Uh, what's the Department of Education's view in that regard? And I would be particularly interested uh, uh, in your uh, to, for your comments in relation to the, and I raised this with our previous guest, the 9% excess uh, places in the integrated sector overall, uh, the operation of the current area planning process, and finally, the unmet demand that exists in some places, how many additional places new integrated schools would be needed, and, and I know Robin, Newton touched on that point just briefly. David? Um, yes, thank, thank you for the question. The, the limited growth uh, in relation to the integrated sector in schools, it, it's down to um, it's set and again in legislation around parental preference. It's the choice of the parents where they, they send the schools. Um, we, we have had 25 schools that have transformed integrated status. Um, which, which has met some of the demand there. We have a number of development proposals that have been approved for growth in integrated schools. Um, the positioning of integrated schools is, as, as, as um, Karen Mullen has said, had said out, is very much appears to be to the east of, of the ban. That's the side that the majority of, of the schools are located. Um, as regards the uh, area planning process, um, the area planning process, as, as Alison has mentioned, NICI are, are, are represented, NICI sit in all those area planning forums, um, and as do the EAC, CMS, etc. The area planning process for integrated schools is exactly the same as it is for any other school sector. It's by way of a development proposal, um, and it's a case for change, consultation so all views are taken on on board on that and I'm, I'm sorry I missed the last point I am um, um, the excess places and operation of the current area planning process yeah the, the, the excess places there there are a number of schools that are bringing forward development proposals to right size and that would be to decrease the approved admissions um, because of the the number of unfilled desks uh, in schools. The, the integrated sector is in that process, and again it was touched on, um, where some schools are transforming the integrated status. They're flourishing and they're growing. Um, some are, are facing challenges, reaching the numbers. Mm -hmm. And we, we do monitor the enrollment numbers, both from uh, the religious balance side as well. And we both nicely and EA to try to address those. Um, as, as best we can, and that is done through various ways and types of support. Okay, um, just a final question, Chair. Yeah. Um, there has been at least one attempt to establish a jointly managed church school. Um, this would feature trustees from all the main churches and agree Christian ethos. Can you indicate how uh, the ethos of these jointly managed church schools would differ from integrated schools? And I have another brief point after that then, just. Um, I actually haven't seen um, the ethos document that's in production um, at the moment. Um, and I'm not, I'm not actually, tell you how that would different, uh, be different from the ethos of integrated schools. We don't actually have one established. So the ethos um, document for, for a jointly managed school is 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 still something that's in draft and i think a key difference sorry sorry um is that um you know the, the requirements for an integrated school are very much set out in legislation there is no legislation um covering what uh, a jointly managed school would would um would however we have issued um a circular 
I think that was in 2015, um, and guidance on that. And it, it, I mean, the, the ethos is described as providing shared education with a Christian ethos, um, with trustee representation, which would be agreed by the transfer churches and the Catholic Church. Um, and similarities, um, I, I would think, in terms, you know, the, the Board of Governors has to have a balanced representation from both of those main communities. Um, but in terms of the of the ethos, it's it's really that's the type of work that we would advise when a school is considering transforming to integration, that um, they would need to be engaging with the, the school community, the wider community, and the parents, the, the Board of Governors, in terms of building up what that ethos is. There's a, there's a large input to come from the ground on that as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, and, 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 and um, seven minutes is almost up, so you need to be brief. Yeah, well, 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 this is just a, a supplementary to that point. Would the department uh, view the establishment of such jointly managed church schools as a fulfillment of the department's obligations in respect of integrated education? No, no is the short answer, if if I may, in terms of their, as a, and it's back to the point, an integrated school is, is very clearly defined in legislation. Um, and so anything that we talk about this morning that would be looking at changing that um, is likely to be taken forward in the wider review of education. So there is an opportunity to consider is that how um, you know, everyone, it, the wider society here wish integrated schools to be defined um, and there is an opportunity coming through that review to, to consider that question. Um, but the short answer to the question is no, and it is because it is legislated that an integrated school is very specifically defined. Okay. Thanks, Daniel. Thank you. Thanks. Daniel, I'm, I must be open and honest. I think it's a shame you didn't give the author of the report an opportunity to respond to your question with regards to their, the independence of the report, given you had him in front of you uh, in the last session. but. That's a comment rather than a question. Um, a couple of quick other comments as well. David, in response to Daniel's question with regards to area planning, you, I may have um, taken it uh, incorrectly, but you seem to suggest that area planning was by sector. Is area planning not by area? Yes, sorry, Chair. The point I was making was that the managing authorities, the sectors are represented on the groups in the area planning. Through area planning, they have a seat at the table, um, and that was specifically in relation to the integrated sector, where NICE um, are part of those groups. Um, and when I said by sector, I was referring to the the sectors being represented on the area planning groups. Okay, and what what has the Department of Education uh, done to ensure that there's robust community consultation as part of that area planning process? Well, the area planning, the development proposals are, um, as you know, Chair consulted on. There is a, a, a period. Um, the A, the Royal Group through the A would also consult on that. Um, the, the specifics of the area plan, I apologize, as I said, my area, I, I don't know the, the specific steps, but the consultation is built into that. And indeed, consultation, when we were talking earlier about schools looking to transform to integrated status, that consultation is key and central to that. And that is a vital role that both NICE and indeed the IEF play in supporting schools through that process. So in, in, in answer to your question, the area planning process, there is consultation built in through that. Um, I don't know the specifics of each um, DP being brought forward as to how much the school would consult, but I would imagine there would be consultation by the school, okay. both with um, the, the, the school staff, the pupils, the parents, other schools, okay. which would all be reflected in the case for change brought through in any development proposal. Okay. Very, very briefly, before bringing Robbie Butler, um, I've, I've heard the term limited growth <coughs> mentioned a, a, a few occasions. There are integrated schools in Northern Ireland, for example, Lagan College, that I believe is one of, if not the most oversubscribed <coughs> schools in Northern Ireland, correct? Yes, yes, yes yeah. that would be right, yes. Right, okay. Robbie Butler. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you. I will, I genuinely, I've only got one thing I want to talk about, guys. I, I will be very brief. Um, and a little bit of background is to uh, just the situation probably in Lagan Valley and Lisburn. 
Um, so I'm going to use my, the school that I attended previously as an example. So I went to a school called Lisnagarvey High School. Um, that school is not an integrated school. However, um, if you compare uh, the intake to that school now in 2020 in comparison to what the intake uh, was in 1982-83 when I started there, it's completely different, but they wouldn't have integrated status. But I can assure you um, that it, uh, if, if it was measured just purely on, on religious uh, grounds, it would probably stack up quite well. So we do hear quite a lot of the um, this, this, this limitation or the limited uh, uptick of uh, integrated education. So my question really is in relation to are we measuring the, the right thing? So I think everybody would agree we do want our uh, young people to be educated together, but in many ways they are. Uh, and this regard is not just doing school in Lagan Valley. It does have Fort Hill, um, Laurel Hill, Wallace and Friends. Uh, there's, there's no barrier in, in any sense, um, and I think they're incredibly inclusive. So... Is it the case um, for schools that are uh, uh, trying to uh, and are actually achieving ac academically high standards that perhaps a further promotion of their, their, the inclusive ethos is maybe what we should be doing and not maybe concentrating so much on the, the integrated with a capital I? There, there are a number of schools, um, both in the, the, the control sector and maintenance sector, they do have um, a, if we're talking about religious balance, a, a fair balance between the traditional Protestant and Roman Catholic community. But an integrated school is much more than that. It's not just measured on the religious balance. Um, it's about the makeup of the teaching staff. It's about integrated ethos, um, for instance, preparing children for sacraments, the playing of both um, what would be seen as traditionally nationalist and Protestant unionist sports. So there, there's a lot more to it, but absolutely, there are a number of controlled and maintained schools that have a good mix of traditionally Protestant and Roman Catholic pupils. Yeah, and, and on that, I would contend that a lot of the things that you alluded to happen in those schools, regardless of them not having a capital I or integrated at the start. And, and I know that the, 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 shared, um, the, 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 the shared policies and processes of the past have been, have been limited in terms of what they've achieved, but I'm just wondering, um, is there an easier way to, 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 get, to, to reach all of those targets that you're suggesting as opposed to just reaching for the, the status of integrated? Um, is there another more efficient methodology? I know it's probably been employed before and some of these recommendation, recommendations lean towards it. Um, but, I mean, in, in a complicated sector, um, the integrated badge is another one of those um, just fragments of the, of the, the equation, you know. Um, and and the, the, the amazing thing is I think literally everybody in this call and, and this, this time today wants the same thing. Um, are, are what are the barriers, do you think? Yeah. Well, if, it, it, it depends really what we're talking about measuring. If we're talking about measuring integration in the terms of an integrated school and integrated ethos, um, it's, it would be around, for instance, changing the, the makeup of the Board of Governors. But what I, what I would say is there have been a number of schools that have successfully transformed um, to integrated status. All schools that have transformed have transformed to control integrated status. Um, and I think shared education also opens the door to, to the, perhaps the path to transformation for some schools. Um, Integrated schools are a sector in their own right. They, they are defined in legislation. And again, from everything from, we talked about religious balance through to the makeup of the Board of Governors, a, a number of other things, that's what an integrated school is. But inter integration, if we're talking about Protestant Catholics mixing together, uh, totally except does go on in, in uh, Catholic maintained schools and controlled schools on a daily basis. I think this is a, a conversation we would have with, with NICE, um, because yeah. we do recognise there are schools that, that are doing absolutely fantastic work out there and do bring um, pupils from uh, you know, a, a range of backgrounds and communities together. Um, and the conversations we've had with NICE have been in and around the, the work that is required to actually go through the transformation process or to become an integrated school and the, the value of that um, in terms of clarifying for the school why they wish to do this what the benefits are and um, you know what the outcomes are that they would wish to see for their pupils and some of that is much further than it's it's the wider conversation um i think you're referring to 
it's much further than looking at the exam results, etc., which are obviously very important. But it's it's the it's the anecdotal, it's the softer um, issues in terms of those pupils. And and um, unfortunately, I I joined the team in January and I was only able to uh, get out to a few schools. But in terms of the integrated sector, when I did get out to schools, what you could really quickly pick up on is the, the ease with which they have conversations that many people in society find difficult about their backgrounds, etc. So I think but the NICE and, and our conversations with them have certainly seen the value in the specific transformation process um, to become integrated. Right. Okay. Just uh, just a final piece, and there's probably a comment you can you can talk to it if you like. So basically, um, thinking about it from the parental point just for you and the student, because obviously uh, parents and students will vote with their feet and their names on the paper. Um, the Board of Governors has got very little to do with anybody's choice of school, as, as far as as far as I know, uh, as a parent, I think. Certainly, you, you, they will look at the curriculum, they look at sporting opportunities, and then probably the language piece as well, um, which is important. So, um, I'm not, I, I think this is, is really important. I just, I, I, I really hate badges and labels, you might say, but you're a unionist, Robbie, but um, I think we need to wear everything we've got a little more lightly. I'm just, I'm still unconvinced as to what needs to change fundamentally. Because Morris Bradley picked up on it earlier on in 2020, what we can do to encourage people to 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 embrace perhaps the schools closer to where they live um, as being more important and then maybe not going past the school, but then that picks up again in the, the segregate, uh, segregated way we live. Um, so a lot of our schools are geographically placed in, in, in almost exclusively um, uh, either uh, unionist or, or nationalist uh, areas, which makes it uh, slightly difficult. And how do you, I suppose this is a question then, if that was the case, then how do you measure the integrated or, or shared status of a school if actually just by geography their, their intake is going to be defined by the people that live there? Yes, the the, the department has, has moved its position um, and understanding uh, as we go through the journey to to discharge our statutory duties, both to integrated and Irish medium education. Um, the, the target that was set, the aspiration target was set that an integrated school would ha have a representation of 40% um, Protestant, 40% Roman Catholic, and 20% other. Um, we fully recognise that due to a number of factors, including demographics, that, that those aspirational targets are extremely difficult to meet. So for a particular area, the minority community representation of pupils at the school of 10% might be uh, reasonable given the demographics of the area. Um, so absolutely, there, there are challenges in being an integrated school, not least of which, depending on the location, is attracting pupils from a minority community. But it's not a one-size-fits-all. It has to be a number of factors are taken into consideration. Uh, so we very much look to work with schools um, in conjunction with colleagues in EA and in NICE um, to help those schools who are struggling um, to attract pupils from an minority community. But yes, the, the location of a school, um, along with other factors, does impact uh, on the ability to attract a balanced community representation of pupils at the school. No problem. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, guys. Okay. Um, can I ask a brief question um, of Shirley? Um, why, why would a, you know, a, a school um, described there by Robbie um, that, that people consider or considers itself integrated not want to be an integrated school? What are what are what are the barriers in your experience? I'm not sure I can say with authority. Um, I, I do think that um, education is very emotive, and um, there is that. And it, it was alluded to, I think, um, when you were talking to to Colm earlier. You know, there is the the family background of parents go to school, the children go to the school, and um, people have a very, you know, a strong attachment and, and feeling to to the school and that's where the the legislative framework within the department that we have is trying to um facilitate you know where that that has to come from parents really um and so i apologies chair i'm not sure i'm able to answer your question in any detail but i i do think it, it's it's such an emotive issue in out on the ground okay um 
I presume your schools aren't um, mapped as being in a unionist or a nationalist area? No, the, 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 the local population demographics will be taken into consideration when we're, we're looking at schools maybe who are um, having difficulty uh, attracting numbers from the minority community. So, um, you know, necessary statistics that will be considered. Um, j just going back to the, the, the previous question, Chair, if I could for a moment, what I would say is the transformation process for any school that transformed into greatest status um, takes a lot of commitment on behalf of the school, the parents, the staff, and the wider community. It is a long journey. It's a, it's a difficult journey, and community engagement is key to that. But as Shirley has said, the onus for that has to come from either the parents or the board of governors of the school. Um, we've had many successful transformations, and it, it is as the guidance sets out. It's a it's a process must be followed. It's set down in legislation. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you. David, uh, can I bring in uh, William Humphrey, please? Um, thanks, thanks, Chairman. David, can I just ask you, when you were talking about the, the balance uh, in, in terms of the schools and so on and about the sports, um, I have to be honest, as someone who's very interested in sport, I don't like sports being given sort of political um, appendages or prefixes, to be honest. Um, uh, you know, sport is sport and, and shouldn't be um, described in that way, but anyway. In terms of the 40-40-20 scenario, how many of your schools, integrated schools in Northern Ireland, would meet the 40-40-20 scenario? The, the vast majority of schools will not meet 40-40-20, and, and that's for a number of reasons. Um, not least being that um, there there's appear to be a more and more parents who would identify as other. They may not wish to identify as from the Protestant or Roman Catholic community, and um, that from a, a school that has been established as a, a, an integrated school, there can be changes in the, the local population, which may lead to particular challenges. Um, so that's why the legislation states reasonable numbers, and those reasonable numbers have to take in a, a number of factors uh, that I've talked about. So the department very much has moved this position from it must be 40, 40, 20, it never was, it was a, it, that's a aspirational, to reasonable numbers for the school and the year in which the school is located. Um, it's a challenge for many integrated schools. We do monitor the minority um, representation enrolment at the schools, and we do work with, I think I said earlier, with, with the Education Authority and NICE to help those schools, to assist those schools, uh, to see what they can do to work towards increasing that um, representation from the, the minority community. It's just, it, I'm a bit confused now. Is the position 40, 40, 20 or reasonable numbers, or is it both? The legislation says reasonable numbers of uh, Protestant Roman Catholic children educated together in school. The 40, 40, 20 was, was set as, a, as what was seen as a a, an aspirational target for what would be integrated schools. It, it was never a hard target. It was never intended to be a hard target. And as time has evolved um, and the understanding and the workings out of the statutory duties and working with the sector has evolved, that we our position is reasonable numbers as defined in legislation. And that, that changes from school to school. There are some schools which att will attract 40, 40, 20, there are thereabouts. But there are some schools for which that will be a challenge. When you, when you talked earlier about the, the makeup in terms of re religious balance, in terms of the workforce, and uh, terms of, is that in terms of teaching staff and other support staff for, for teachers? Yeah. It is. Yes, it would be teaching and, and non-teaching staff. Yes. So so how does that apply then? In this in, society uh, where people should be uh, open to apl um, uh, applying for employment regardless of their religious background? The, the, the makeup of, of the, the teaching staff and the non-teaching staff at the school, it merely integrated education is that, that there should be representation from both communities in that, how that is done. Well, that, well that's different uh, to balance, though. Representation is different to balance. The, you said the religious, 
The religious bomb, sorry. The religious bombs refers to the pupils attending the school. Mm -hmm. When we when were you were asking about the 40, 40, 20. Yeah. That was the pupils at the school. The staff at the school, there are no targets. There are no, it's not 50, 50. It, it doesn't have to be that. It's just, it has to be a mix of. Right, so, so there are no, people can apply and if the school um, is in a position whereby, I mean, I, for example, the point I'm trying to make is I opposed the quotas in the police because I, there's no such thing as positive discrimination. It's discrimination. So um, in terms of uh, the teaching staff in an integrated school, people are interviewed, selected and awarded a, a post or a position based on their ability and nothing else. Yes. Yes, that's right. Yes. That's okay. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, William. Justin McDonnell. <clears throat> Chair, um, and thank you, Alison, Shirley, and David, for your evidence today. Um, maybe touching on a point which has just been made, um, there are a number of examples of mixed post primary schools where the minority community exceeds 30% that don't have integrated school status, but who are welcoming and inclusive and often have high levels of academic achievement. Is it not the case that this is exactly what's needed? High performing schools with a welcoming and inclusive ethos, but not necessarily integrated with a capital A. I think then, I mean, where, where we would be looking at the, the wider review of education, I really would need to pick up on that. That is set, integrated schools are defined in legislation. Um, and that's primary legislation. That's not something that um, we have been in a position to, to change. Um, I think it's reflected in, in Com's report as well. And it, I think it is that that broader issue of, you know, society has moved on from um, from 1989 when the primary legislation was written, and um, there is an opportunity then to to have that discussion and um, and see what is actually wanted as to how we recognise. Do we wish to have all the different types of schools? And I mean, when we talk about integrated schools, it, a lot of it is very much that it's a management type of school. And um, so in terms of the legislation, some of that is into the sort of more dry areas, whereas I think what you're talking about is the, the sort of rea reality of, of a vibrant and successful school. OK, and why does the department not potentially consider promoting that aspect of education, perhaps through the use of the open and welcoming Kate Mark for all schools? Well, I think it exists. Yeah, it does. I mean, every school, a good school, promotes, and that's the policy for, for um, educational um, achievement across all sectors of schools. Uh, the kite mark, uh, in particular, uh, reference to the recommendations that Colin made uh, was really, um, when we had discussions with NICE, that um, originally was rejected as a concept. Um, they didn't see um, the value in that, you know, every school should strive to be a good school. I think um, NICE are looking more towards their excellence um, and integration um, yeah. uh, awards um, that they already have in place and putting that on a more formal footing. Um, but as Shirley says, I think there's an opportunity within um, the review um, to look at a lot of these issues in more detail. And certainly this uh, report and its recommendations are going to form part of that going forward. What's the department's sense? Uh, you know, this has been an ongoing discussion for many years now. Are we making progress? Yes, I mean, NICE are um, definitely doing a very good job. Um, they're funded to um, encourage and facilitate the growth of integrated education. Um, we've been working alongside them um, before the pandemic gone out, um, doing roadshows, um, for example, with lots of schools that have expressed interest um, at workshops in becoming um, integrated. Um, um, the, the guidance that we've provided has, has given them a clear platform in, in terms of how that would happen um, going forward. Um, shared education has been measured, mentioned several times this morning and anecdotally principals would say, well, the next stage for us would be to move to integration. You know, so I, I do think there, is, there are very positive strides forward. Okay, just touching on what Robbie may have mentioned earlier, the department's shared education and creed uh, policies uh, or cred policies are designed to improve relations between communities. Does the department think that 
that shared education projects will lead to greater informal and formal integration of our school system. Well, as I just said, there there is anecdotal evidence coming back from the principals who are participating in, in shared education partnerships um, that that might be something that they would consider in the future. And interestingly enough, 50 integrated schools are participating in shared education partnerships as well. And NICE have been instrumental in some of the training that has been delivered um, to the teaching staff across our shared education partnerships. So we're certainly working together. Um, community connections is probably one of those things that we need to work on better uh, with shared education. Um, uh, and um, But certainly there are reconciliation outcomes for the children and the teaching staff indeed, but there are, there are still challenges remaining in that programme too. I must, I must uh, recall uh, my own, in my own school days, my uh, teacher uh, introduced a shared education project with Newry High School. I went to the Abbey in Newry. We played, and William touched on sport, we played one half Gaelic football and one half hockey. I was good at the Gaelic football, but it wasn't much use to the hockey. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, a, it was a brilliant introduction to uh, shared education at a time when shared education wasn't even a concept. So. Yeah. I must uh, applaud the work of the great Aidan O'Rourke, rookie, who has raised actually a million pounds for charity with his quiz nights on a weekly basis. Um, and he was a visionary, and that's the sort of positive ethos all schools should embrace, that we're all part of the same community. So here, guys, thank you very much for your evidence. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Morris Bradley. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks very much for the presentation, folks. Uh, I just want to touch on Recommendation 28, uh, and I alludes to the development and approval of integrated educational schools. I uh, that because uh, the most recent new build that we have had in Corian has been the Integrated College, uh, which is recommended for another new build, uh, and it's now on hold. But just over a mile away, the crow flies is Corian College. It's in a dilapidated state. Yet the department had originally given preference to another new build integrated college over Corian College. And Corian College enrollment has been rising year on year. And it's also integrated without having the capital A uh, with people from mixed backgrounds. Now, I'm, I'm only using this as an example and not being specific. But I would be a supporter of integrated education, but certainly not in its current form, which I believe is wrong. Can I ask why integrated provision is given preference over controlled or casting maintained throughout Northern Ireland? And would shared education not be a more equitable way of progressing shared education as opposed to the current education integrated education policy, which clearly is not achieving the same? Well, we have a statutory duty to encourage and facilitate both integrated and Irish medium education, um, and the statutory duty to encourage and facilitate and promote shared education. Um, so those work hand in hand. Um, and as I said, a lot of the integrated schools are involved in shared education partnerships um, and uh, um, giving them the benefit of their uh, long experience and actually their ethos and, and tackling um, difficult issues um, with ease in terms of um, integrated schools. Um, so I, I, you know, that, that, that's the, the, the statutory position that we have. We, we are in a situation where we have to encourage and facilitate integrated education. But would you not agree with me that it, it isn't really working the way it's been done at the moment? Well, I think shared education um, uh, uh, in its inception and, and its implementation across the system is actually having uh, really, really big rewards um, in terms of you know, bringing children together um, and teaching staff together and, and boards of governors uh, and training uh, you know, is provided for them as well. So it's, 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 a, it's a logical step. I think towards um, a more um, integrated um, education system, um, and as I said, there is anecdotal evidence um, from from principals participating in shared education that that is they would um, that might want to look at in the future. But it's you know it's, integrated education has to come from the ground up. There has to be parental preference, parental um, balloting. Um, uh, that the board of governors have to go out to the parents to establish if they want. Um, to transform to integrated status. Um, there has to be a lot of community engagement um, also in terms of transforming to integrated status. Um, and we, we are sort of working across Northern Ireland at the minute to promote shared and integrated education. Um, 
in a way that wasn't previously done, I think, you know, so this, these things take some time um, culturally um, uh, to, to manifest positively uh, in our society. And the independent yeah. review really says will we'll give us an opportunity to look at this in more detail. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, I, I, uh, I, I think the undergraduate education system needs a massive overhaul. Parents will want their children to attend the school that offers the best educational prospects for them to further their careers. Uh, whether they have a label of Catholic or Protestant, uh, I think it's immaterial, and I think it needs a massive rethink. Thank you, Chair. Morris, when you say it's not working, well, other than what you've just said there, what, what, in what way is it not working? It, if you take the demographics of Northern Ireland, where there's a, a, a large Protestant area or a large Catholic area, it's virtually impossible to have integrated education. Uh, it just doesn't work. Uh, and, you know, in my own area here uh, in Corian, we have an integrated college, which is, I would say, 70, 75 percent Protestant. It's, it's not working. I mean, lost St. Joseph's College, which is a Catholic maintained college, has, has now uh, disappeared off the map. Okay. Thank, thanks for your questions there, Morris. Um, just uh, before I uh, close up here, then, or can I ask a few questions? Um, Alison, the Independent Review of Education made 38 recommendations, um, 39 recommendations. How, how many of those recommendations have been implemented? So those that are actioned or that are in progress are recommendation. Well, how, how, uh, many have been, how many have been actioned? Well, um, eleven. Eleven. Yeah. Actioned. Implemented. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Or that are, are work in, in progress, chair, in terms of um, you know, for example, um, Morris was mentioning their recommendation twenty eight. So that cross cuts with with Treasury. So there are some that are still a work in progress, but that um, work is being done on them. So there's there's 11 in that category. Okay. How many are there in the actioned category? 11. We would say 11. Okay, but that's the actioned or on work in progress category. What's what's the actioned category? Well, in terms of those that are actioned, I mean, some, some will take more time to come to fruition than others. So that's why we're categorizing those as a, a actioned or in progress um, a, in terms of the briefing we provided. So you can't, you can't answer that then? No. OK. So in, the, in terms of um, not actioned or work in progress, is that 28 recommendations out of 39 that are not being actively progressed. Yes, you could um, you could say that. Um, Minister has agreed that fifteen of those will be taken forward um, as a focused um, part of the independent review of education, um, and there are uh, rash there is a rationale for why um, some of the recommendations are not being taken forward at all. What what it, what is that rationale? Well, for example, the ETI continuum recommendation um, uh, for schools to self-assess their practices, methodologies and capacity. Uh, when we've consulted with colleagues in the ETI, their, their position on this is that they have the inspection and self-evaluation framework already um, for each phase of education in school um, and that there is no need to have um, a sector-specific um, self-assessment methodology. Okay, so sorry, so just to check in. So there's a, eleven being action. How many not be had that have been rejected? One, two, three. Eleven. Eleven. Okay. Okay. Uh, in terms of, of a number of particular recommendations, then um, recommendation two, the, the authors have identified recommendation two, uh, three, mm -hmm. and uh, thirty-eight as being of particular importance. Recommendation two is that the Department of Education brings forward legislation to place a duty on the Department of Education and the Education Authority and the power and all other arm's length bodies to encourage, facilitate and promote integrated education. Um, the Minister's update in relation to that recommendation says that recommendation two is within the remit of the Northern Ireland Council for Integrated Education to take forward as it is charged with the promotion of integrated education. My department does not promote any sector above another. Could the department give some clarity as to what mechanism 
NICE could use to bring forward legislation to place a duty on the Department of Education to promote integrated education? No, I think the answer was really that um, NICE are funded to promote integrated education in Northern Ireland. Um, it's not for them to bring forward legislation. They wouldn't be able to do that. Um, the position is that no one sector is promoted over another. And if we were to bring legislation forward to promote integrated education, then we would also have to consider that for all other sectors okay, and shared so education is that, is that sector. Is that recommendation rejected then? I think we would we would um, contend that really we are discharging the promotion of, of integrated education because the department uh, funds NICE to, to undertake that duty and that's in line with the legislation and the same in terms of synergy with regards to the Irish medium sector. Okay, but the Minister is rejecting the recommendation that the Department of Education brings forward legislation to promote integrated education. Yes, that was one of the ones that he said would not be taken forward. Okay. Uh, recommendation 11 uh, is that all development proposals for closures and amalgamations of existing schools should be required to demonstrate explicitly in the case for change that they have given meaningful consideration to a sustainable, integrated, jointly managed or shared solution. Recommendation 13, um, DE should remove all financial disincentives to shared education partnerships that wish to amalgamate uh, through the development process to become either integrated or jointly managed. And recommendation 14 is the Department of Education should develop clear guidance and a funded support package for schools that wish to follow this pathway. Um, the Minister has said these recommendations will be taken on by the independent review, but these are of material relevance and, and critical components of area-based planning, which will continue to be delivered by the planning authorities. So why, why, um, why will those be taken forward by the independent review um, when they're such a critical pro component of area planning, um, which will be delivered by planning authorities during the period of the independent review? Has the department given any guidance to the planning authorities in relation to these recommendations? We haven't given guidance to, no. to the authorities at this point. Um, I, I think um, these relate to, I mean, the disincentives, etc., relating to the common funding formula. And as, as you will be aware, Chair, there's a, a separate review of that. And um, area planning is, is part of the also part of the transformation program. So there is a, these are not all singularly being taken forward in isolation but in terms of considering a different way of doing something um, I think the, it, it's, it's appropriate to consider that in the wider discussion coming out of the review of education and um, you know that if the area planning process was to require that it will not be taken any further forward unless um, Every, the school can demonstrate in what way or how they have decided that they are determined whether they would become an integrated school or a jointly managed school. Um, you know that's that's quite a significant um, policy shift, and it also relates to the wider education provision, which is why um, I think it does it appropriately as part of the considerations um, that will be and the discussions and that conversation that we've we've touched on already this morning. You know that will take place as part of the review of education. And so have these recommendations been explicitly included in the terms of reference for the independent review of education? Well, we have been talking to our policy colleagues that are taking that forward um, to ensure that they will be explicitly um, referenced in the terms of reference. Yes. So, they, so, they, so those, the recommend, the, those recommendations will be in the terms of reference for the independent review that the executive will consider? The terms of reference will um, explicitly state that um, there's a section um, in the draft terms of reference um, that are there currently. If I could just pull it up, um, you know the the areas of work that have a linkage to its work, and we have um, given a form of words to explicitly include these 15 recommendations relating to the um, review of integrated education. Um, they, so the, the 15 recommendations will not be set on the face of the terms of, of reference, is my understanding. Um, and, um, but they have been given to, to the policy team and there is a process for ensuring that the specific 
um, recommendations are passed to the panel once that is established. Okay, and does that include 11, 13 and 14? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it does. Yes, there's 15. Okay. Um, thank you uh, very much for your uh, your presentations today. Sorry, Daniel, you wanted to come back in briefly. Yeah, yeah, chair. Just just in relation to a point you would raised earlier, why I didn't raise it with the uh, with our previous guest? It's because it, it wasn't the author that established the review. It was the department, and therefore it was the department's responsibility, not the author. So that's why I didn't raise it directly with uh, Colin Kavanagh. I raised it with the department because I believe it's their responsibility. So that that's the reason for that question, and it, it confirmed uh, my concern and that they probably wouldn't have an answer to it. And that's exactly what has happened. So the independence is independence from the department in terms of an independent review commissioned by a department. Is that, is that accurate, Alison? Yes, it is, Chair. Okay, so the authors are independent of the Department of Education? Yes, they both were. Okay. But yeah, but one of, one, one of those was the president of, of uh, NICI. One of the people commissioned the department was the, was the president of NACI at the time. Yeah. So that's not independent. It's independent of the Department of Education. Yeah. yeah. I think we leave it there. Um, okay. Thanks very much indeed for your, your presentation. Um, there's obviously a, a range of issues there for us to continue to take forward. Um, disappointing amount of recommendations that have been actioned um, and a, a piece of work for us to continue to keep an eye on. But thank you very much for your engagement today. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, Clark, um, I bring members uh, into the spotlight and ask Clark to summarise any uh, actions or requests for additional information resulting from the two briefings today. Okay, Chairperson, thank you. So just waiting for members to rejoin the spotlight. So this is where they can uh, stop me and indicate I've got it wrong. So perhaps the committee uh, following those two briefings wants to do the following, um, possibly write the CCMS and just seek clarity on their policy in respect of the veto exemption around post-primary transfer, as Mr. Kavanagh referred to. Um, also, um, right to the department, uh, just to seek an update uh, if indeed the recommendations that are in the uh, integrated education report are to be included in the independent review of education. My understanding was, Chairperson, that's a matter for the executive uh, rather than for the department or even the minister. Um, so uh, we can get um, confirmation on that. And also asking the department about the level of oversubscription and overprovision in integrated schools on a school by school basis. Um, ask them to explain, if necessary, on the uh, independence of uh, the uh, report authors. Um, yes. Also, we also ask them to explain why the differential sectors recommendation is not being taken forward. So this was the bit about um, uh, undertaking a survey to see how reconciliation um, uh, attitudes vary across the different educational sectors. I've had a quick look at the Young Life and Time survey. It does include information about reconciliation, but it doesn't do it by educational sectors. The two aren't quite the same. Um, perhaps seek sight of the draft ethos document for jointly managed church schools. I was quite surprised by that. The department briefed the predecessor committee about this and they were fit to tell members quite a bit about it then, so I was surprised they don't have a, any kind of ethos um, document. And, and then perhaps also ask the department to specify those recommendations that have indeed been actions rather than in progress. Uh, Chairperson, have I missed anything there, members? Um, if, you're, if, you're seek, if you're seeking the, the level of oversubscription um, for integrated schools, you can just do it for all schools. Okay. Can I, can Robin, I you want to come in? Yeah, sure. Uh, can I just... Uh, uh, there, may, there may or may not be evidence for, for this, but the comment was made about that the integrated education in the west of the Ban area is, is not being taken up as it might be in the east, east of the Ban area. Is there any evidence or any work being done uh, around that, uh, Chair? And can I ask, uh, in terms of the Methodist College, which, as I understand it, was a, a college established by the Methodist Church initially for the education of 
the sons and daughters of Methodist ministers, but is indeed, as I understand it, a faith-based organisation still, but indeed has the integrated, no sorry, does not have the integrated, but is an integrated mm. college with a very high percentage, perhaps the 40, 40, 20 even, uh, att attending the college, but certainly growing numbers in, in there. Can we maybe just try to understand uh, the Methodist College situation, Chair? Sure. Yeah, um, I think it's often referred to as super mixed. Um, you might you might want to, I mean, I think members have touched on what is the difference between um, a super mixed school and an integrated school. So it might be worth taking a, a briefing on what is an integrated school from um, a particular body at some point in time. Um, yeah. it's, there was a lot of debate there in terms of what, what Royal, it is or what, Royal Academy would be exactly the same. What it isn't. What is a super mixed school? What is an integrated school? Obviously, there the intake is not is not the only um, basis on which a, a school would be described as integrated. Um, yeah, happy to look into that. Any other members want to come in? I think the point that that Morris yeah. raised around the uh, the money. Now, you know, that, that's something which you hear um, quite often about schools looking to go down the road of um, integration uh, for financial reasons. Uh, and therefore, a school that chooses to do that gets um, rewarded with money, when other schools that are equally good schools in the nearby vicinity are unable to get their buildings upgraded because they, are, they have not chosen to do that. That doesn't mean that school is any less a good school. It doesn't mean that school isn't necessarily integrated, but um, is being in integrated um, naturally, if I can use that term. So I, th I think that would be something I would be interested in as well. I think that's a fair point. Uh, so, Chair, just to come back on the on Methodist College, is, uh, as the member rightly said, to say, it describes itself as, uh, as an interdenominational school. But if I remember correctly, because the committee visited Methodist College, I'm not sure if the member was on. I, I was. You on? Yeah. That was Christmas. I, I, I was. Yeah. Gosh, how many years ago was that? Um, but I think at the time when they did give us evidence, uh, I believe the Methodist Church has some representation on their board of governors. But they would describe themselves in a denominational um, school. They're not an integrated school. But they would have. I, I think I'm pretty sure the members right that they are super mixed. That there'd be a high level of members of what you might term the minority community, and I bet that would be the what same for, for BRA as well, and other schools in Columbanus, Banbridge Academy. Uh, there, there's a couple more, um, Colmore Primary, and uh, and others, as I recall. Um, so the committee is then for seeking an oral briefing just around these definitions. Um, INST would be another one, but I, I, I don't know what the same level. It's not my area as such. Yeah, INST, would be, in, INST would be a school that would draw from across the community. And I mean from very much from the ethnic minorities because it also has a boarding facility. As well. Absolutely. Uh, members, in your pack you can find uh, just the, uh, an excerpt from the predecessor committee's inquiry into shared and integrated education. A lot of that information is there, but um, I think members want an oral briefing, so we'll sort out an oral briefing, Chairperson, if that all of those actions are agreed, Chairperson. Any other members? Okay. Agreed? They agreed, Member. <coughs> Is that um. agreed? Those actions agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Agreed. Okay. Clark, uh, we move then to correspondence. Lovely. Agenda item seven. Are you okay to speak to the correspondence, Clark? You're a happy chairperson. <laughs> yeah. That's... Sorry, will I catch up on my pack, which is going slow? So, members, at uh, page 297 of your packs, we have 18 items of correspondence plus one tabled item. Summary note is at page 27, so uh, I can ask if members are content to dispose of it, of the correspondence as per the summary, with the following exceptions. So um, the first one, really just to bring to your attention, it's page 301. This is a response from the Education Authority about, um, we had a briefing about the special schools area planning process. Officials indicated that a professional development um, program package would be put in place uh, in support of, um, of what was planned uh, in order to help um, the special schools and the development of the learning support centres in mainstream schools. 
EA indicates it has apparently not developed substantive plans in this regard, so that was one of the things that members wanted to establish. Uh, the relevant consultation concludes in December, um, and I'm waiting for confirmation from the Education Authority that they will return to us early in the new year about the, um, the outcomes um, of that consultation. So are members content to note that, Chairperson? Okay. Lovely. Okay, then. Um, at item 7.3, this is page 304. This is a response from the Minister on lockdown and access to support for vulnerable children, which the committee were briefed about last week. It's essentially a restatement of the evidence which um, officials provided orally last week. Um, um, the, the committee is going to have a Zoom conference, informal Zoom conference, next Thursday. Um, they want to uh, revisit those issues then. So, in the meantime, are the committee content to note? Chair, I can't make Okay, so if I'll just recap then um, on that one. So, page 304, it's response from the Minister, lockdown and access to support for vulnerable children. It's essentially a restatement of what officials said um, in some detail um, uh, last week. So, uh, if members can tend to note that for now, uh, the committee will return to this issue again at an informal Zoom conference next Thursday. So, you can tend to note for now. Agreed. 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 Lovely. The other one I wanted to pick out was at page 415. This is a response from the department on October monitoring. Um, they tell us quite a bit about special school uh, capital programme. Um, confirms that there is a new resource or capital package as yet to support the new special schools area planning approach, but I think they indicate that the minister is uh, planning in 2021 a, um, a new build, a major capital um, sort of call for uh, call for projects. Um, also, there's clarification. Uh, officials incorrectly. Um, advised the committee that the uh, minister had uh, given a ministerial direction in respect of Struel. He hasn't yet. He is waiting for <coughs> confirmation from HM Treasury that um, Fresh Start Capital um, can be used for that project. <coughs> Additionally, there's a response on questions. I think that Mr. McCrossan asked about CCMS and SIA and the additional money, and it seems to be around things like pay pressures, contract services, and rent. So just to confirm with members that they are content with what they've got, and I hope, Mr. McCrossan, that that answered the question that you asked at the time. Okay, looking yes. good. Lovely good. Are members content then? Chair? Agreed. Agreed. Lovely. Thank sorry, you very much. Sorry, Chair. Right. Chair. Item nine, I'm, I'm desperately looking for item nine. Yes. General Teaching Council, page four hundred and thirty two. Four three two. Just come into that now, yeah. yeah. Oh, right, okay. Yep. All right. So okay. Uh, as uh, the member has just referred to, this is a response from DE um, about the General Teaching Council. So, to clarify, members, and sorry for the explanation, but um, teachers in schools are required to register, so they get a little registration number, and that comes from the General Teaching Council. If the teacher was subject to um, significant misconduct, I mean, very serious misconduct, what happens is the General Teaching Council can investigate and they can apply sanctions, and the sanctions could include deregistration. So that could stop the teacher teaching in the school again. So you can imagine some of the very serious things that might make you want to ensure that a teacher doesn't teach anymore. Fair enough. Um, in the annual report and accounts, which the department produced, there were a couple of lines about the VIRES, the, the legal authority that the General Teacher, Teaching Council is, or the department is supposed to have in this regard. Um, the committee wrote about this. The department has written back confirming the GTCNI currently lacks the correct legislative authority to undertake robust investigations into allegations of misconduct or to provide any sanction, including deregistration of teachers, and that the department is working to bring forward the necessary amendments to primary legislation. Um, so that is, um, I think maybe Mr. Newton might recall, long ago, was it five years ago, I think the department came to the committee with a an SR statutory rule, which they wanted passed in a hurry to ensure that the department had the virus to deal with this. Well, here we appear to be again where um, GTCNI does not have the virus to do what it's supposed to do, and they're, they're, they give a various explanations for why that is. So, um, Chairperson, I think I'm sensing members may wish to comment. So, yep, members wish to come in. So obviously, it's obviously a very serious situation, yep. Chair. 
policy requires the look that five years ago, Peter, you said? I, maybe. I think it was, it was 2016 <coughs> I, or something like that. It was like September and they came to us with um, a statutory rule and they were in a big hurry because what had happened was the department had deleted the General Teaching Council's, no, they deleted their own virus about um, the deregistration of teachers by accident. Um, and the idea was that it would transfer the General Teaching Council, but that didn't happen. So they came back in a hurry, said, no, please pass the statutory rule so that we can get our virus back. The committee did, the assembly did, everything was fine, we thought. And then here we are again, back to the same situation where the virus apparently um, don't exist. Uh, not only that, they can't do uh, robust um, investigations or apply any um, uh, any sanctions for teachers. And these these would be, to be clear, very rare situations. Mm -hmm. But you know, you could understand why you'd want to um, have the uh, authority, the legal authority, to <coughs> require a teacher to keep away from the school in a particular, very special and unique um, situations. Chairperson. Yeah, I, I agree, Robin. So, Clark, General Teaching Council lacks the correct legislative authority to undertake investigations into serious allegations of misconduct or provide any sanction, including deregistration of teachers, as it stands. Yeah, Robin, I agree. An, an extremely serious situation, and about which the committee has not been communicated with. Um, Daniel, did you want to come in there before I propose our action? Daniel. Yeah, ju just uh, uh, we need an exit. How, how is this able to happen? Like, this is the department's fault; it's their responsibility. I just can't understand how how this has been allowed to happen twice, two, not even once, twice. Yeah. So my proposed action would be to write to the minister. Um, expressing serious concern of the committee and to ask how this state of affairs has happened and why the committee was not informed what action is being taken to address the situation. Members content with that no, I think the other, the other question you would ask is when did it become clear that we were in this position? Okay. Um, because if, to be fair, if it's only bec it's only become clear now, then they have written to us in a, in, in a timely period, but if it's something that they've been aware of for some time and haven't, then that's a different issue. So, okay. Obviously, some five years ago, something fell through the gap somewhere. Okay. Members content to inquire as to when it was known, how it happened, um, what action is being taken to address, and obviously we expect an urgent response to that. Peter, thanks. So, Chairperson, moving on then to item 10, which is at page 435. This is a response from SIA on contingency arrangements for examinations and curriculum delivery. It's actually quite an interesting letter because they explain things. I, I find it interesting anyway. But SIA has confirmed that the position in respect of Northern Ireland students taking um, WJEC, so Welsh Board examinations, will not be clarified until January 2021. So as the Minister indicated during question time the other day, um, in Wales they've taken a different approach to uh, examinations. Um, and there are some students, I think it's about a hundred, a couple of hundred of students in Northern Ireland who actually take Welsh board examinations. So um, this position actually hasn't been clarified for them and will not be until, according to the letter, until January 2021. So um, perhaps, Chairperson, the committee might want to again write to the Minister asking for details of the contingencies and options which SIA has provided in its advice to him including consideration of moderated centre assessed grades processes. So um, what this is about is what are we going to do in 2021? Obviously a situations in a state of flux, um, vaccination on the horizon um, uh, and all that. But the question is what options has SIA provided uh, to the minister in respect of end of year examinations? And might they include things like uh, moderated centre assessed uh, grades, which would be a step up from what we perhaps used last time. Chairperson, if yep. that's agreed. I'm content with that. Members agreed? Agreed. 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 Thank you. Thanks, members. And the other one I was just going to pick out was at page 446. This is from Rainey and Dowd School. They're expressing concerns regarding current proposals for GCSEs and A-level examinations. They are quite complex, the, the issues that they've raised, and, and very eloquently too. But 
uh, I'm sort of struggling a little with what they've said. So I suggest, Chair President, that the committee writes the same, seeking its comments on the detailed points that uh, Rainey and Dowd have made. Agreed. Chairperson, that's agreed. 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 And then, not quite finally, will we, um, we will re receive a copy of that response. We will ask for that. Yes, yeah. Chairperson. Okay. Um, then we have. Um, yeah, at uh, page 454, Action for Children have provided information on its Blues programme and its potential to support the goals currently outlined in the Children and Young People's Emotional Health and Wellbeing and Education Framework, which was the committee was briefed about a week or two ago. Um, so Action for Children is actually seeking the opportunity to brief the committee, suggesting maybe, Chair, that the committee notes for now um, as the department will be briefing on the Children and Young People's strategy on the 16th of December, and perhaps we could um, reconsider then. That agreed? Yeah, members agreed. 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 Chair, can I just go there? That's okay. Oh, Robbie, wow. go ahead, Robbie. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Peter. Um, I'm glad you picked that up. Of just a wee note on this one because obviously we, in the in the forward work program, and I don't want to jump too far ahead. Uh, we have a pe uh, piece which is the emotional health and well-being, and it's 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 the work with the committee for health. But notwithstanding, obviously we have the framework being delivered by the Department of Education. We have the framework uh, from the Department of Health and the strategy. I think actually there's a wee bit of urgency on this. Um, and Action for Children Blues program is particularly good, but there are other. Uh, people out there too. So I think maybe we need to get close to tying down some dates for some of these groups that are already providing and probably can demonstrate measurably how effective some of their strategies are. So one thing in the food kit, I know we'll, we'll pick it up in, in uh, the forward work program, but we want to lose this, this communication here uh, in that conversation. Okay, so do we have a proposal for when be able to fit that briefing in. Do you, do you want me to fit it in? Right. Well, yeah. Yes. I'll, I'll, I'll book that in. Book that in. Yeah. Take it as booked. Okay. Thank you. It'll okay. be the new year, but um, yeah, there. Yep. Right. Okay. Um, moving on, if the committee are content, is um, at uh, page four six five is a correspondence from a concerned parent about post primary transfer, and they make re reference to the use of an app, um, and just to seek the committee's agreement to uh, write to the department seeking clarity on whether the claim made that this particular um, uh, transfer test app is supported or recommended by the department and whether schools can use engage program money for the purpose that has been suggested in order to support the use of, of said app um, and seek clarity on that basis from the department. Members content? Agreed? Yep, agreed. Lovely. And Thank then you. finally, tabled items. This is a reply from the minister assuring the committee that guidance to schools about examinations um, has been uh, provided and actually providing us with a copy of um, said guidance. So, members content to note that one. Okay. Was that, when was that provided? That would have been provided just Thursday. this morning. Okay. Uh, it was last Thursday. The yeah. guidance was received last Thursday, Justin? In schools, yeah. but yeah, yeah, it came to the committee. Sorry, it came to the committee just this morning, but sorry, yes. I think schools yeah. were given guidance last Thursday, just after it would have been raised, I think, by the member under AOB last week. Justin, do you want to come in on that at all? Yeah, well, I think it's incredible that um, two days before exams commence that they're getting guidance on how those, those exams should operate. I find that incredible. So, public health guidance to support public examinations was issued to all schools on the 19th of November, and exams started on Monday, the 22nd. No, 23rd. 23rd. Sorry. Right. So one. So two, two school days before this day, no, not even two school days before one, the exams. One yes. working day. One, one day they implemented. One, one day, no surprise. One day. Can we can we respond, members, to ask why it was issued one working day before the commencement of November examinations? Members content with that? Are we really shocked, Chair? It's a, it's a department with their hands over their ears and eyes closed to reality. It's unbelievable. It is, I mean, it, it is, to be serious, it, it is one of the key feedbacks from principals that the guidance they receive across a range of issues is frequently received with less than adequate notice. Um, is that, can we all, so in addition to asking why it was received at that timing, um, can, we, can we ask that if that guidance pertains to all future public examinations and post-primary transfer tests? Okay. 
Members yeah. can tell. Agreed. 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 Except, um, Chair, I think that the post primary, not, not to bring this up again, but the post primary transfer test is slightly different. And, 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 and the answer from the department may be yes, that guidance is appropriate. But it would be hard to understand how it could be appropriate, given the fact that they're going to be in these like, super centres. Uh, just as a point of note, really, rather than a, than a further question, but absolutely happy to support the. the clear. Well, okay. I get. I... I think I understand what you're saying. Um, we can ask if it applies to all future public examinations and post primary transfer tests. If it does not apply to post primary transfer tests, what what um, public health guidance does apply? Yeah. And for who is responsible for its implementation? Okay. Is that a bit more accurate, Robbie? Yeah, yes, absolutely. I think I, I think we already know what the, the answer will come back at Board of Governors, which isn't satisfactory, by the way. Um, that's a fairly common answer. Yep. Okay. Um, any any other comments in relation to correspondence, Clark? Uh, I don't have any of the members. No, are members content. content. Okay. Thank you. Agenda item eight. We're at risk of finishing on time here, Clark. Uh, forward work programme. Can I refer members to the draft forward work programme at page 467 and ask the clerk to speak to the forward work programme? Uh, just a quick one to remind members that the uh, committee previously sought data from SIA on A level grade awards uh, prior to 17th of August 2020 uh, compared with teacher predictions. So SIA provided the information. Uh, Assembly Research has reviewed it and produced a paper summarising the findings. It suggested that we have a closed session briefing on the 16th of December, uh, by which time maybe we, we may have the findings of the Deloitte uh, review into uh, the same subject. So if members are content to do that on that time scale. Agreed. 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 Okay, Thanks. Very good. And then the Youth Work Alliance is asked to come on the 13th of January to discuss COVID and other issues affecting their sector. Um, and um, I, I currently, well, I may be wrong, but I don't expect the EA to be in a position to brief on special schools area planning on the 13th of January. So, if members are content for me to rejig um, accordingly, is that okay? Can I just add to that? Sorry, Peter. Yep. Um, so, the, um, in terms of the youth sector, I, I'm still understanding the representative bodies, but um, you have Youth Work Alliance, I think you also have what's called the Uniform Hub. Um, and then potentially Youth Network NI. Would it be prudent for us, if scheduling allows on that session, to hear from the Youth Work Alliance, the Uniform Hub, and Youth Network NI in whatever time spanned way permits? And bring William in there as well. Yeah, yeah. funny. I, I actually have, and I was going to raise in any other business, um, I declare an interest, um, Chair, as a member of the Scout Association. Um, the uniformed organisations are a very serious situation across the UK. I mean, uh, the Scout Association is in a position where potentially 500 groups nationally could be under threat because of the, the ramifications of COVID. Um, but that also has implications in terms of employment for those who are employed by those organisations centrally and then regionally, but also in terms of the, the uh, activity centres that they will have here locally. Uh, Crawford's Burn, Lorne, yep. the guides, Ganaway for the BB, Ballyhornan for Scouting Ireland, and so on. And uh, I, uh, as you know, we had when we had last of youth service in front of us, we I raised the issue uh, on, on behalf of them around those centres and the clarifications around activities and all of that. Um, I think it would be very important to hear the, their view because, uh, uh, to be honest, they are working with tens of thousands of young people across Northern Ireland, or I should say they want to be, uh, and they're constrained and restricted at the moment in terms of COVID. Much easier to do so in the good weather when they can do things outside, much more difficult whenever we move into the inclement weather and, and, and the cold of winter. So I, I would I would propose that the Uniform Hub definitely would, would be included in that because it's important to hear from Youth Service and the Youth Work Alliance or whatever, but they tend to be more statutory and, and paid for by the state. These other Organisations are obviously hugely managed largely by volunteers, giving of their own time, and, and their voices to be heard too, Chair. Uh, absolutely. I think the Uniform Hub, Clark and members, covers Girl Guide in Ulster, Scout in Ireland, Catholic Guides of Ireland, Boys Brigade, Scouts NI, and Uniform Hub facilitator is Claire King. So yeah. um, I think Youth Work Alliance 
reform hub and youth network and I think is the other representative body. I think if we had the three um, bodies, that would be a, a comprehensive engagement that day. Thanks, Clark. Will do. Okay, members, members uh, content to agree that board work program is amended. Agreed. 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 Thanks, Robin. Um, okay, members. Uh, any other business? No. <laughs> Daniel shaking his head. Whoa. I'm trying to feel, feel uneasy finishing on time here. I'm sort of like delaying and so that we're late. Um, okay. Date and time of next formal meeting then, members, is Wednesday the 2nd of December in the Senate Chamber at 9.30 a.m. Committee meeting does now adjourn. Thank you. Thanks, uh, members. Thank you. Did we get a lie in actually? <laughs> <laughs> This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.